if I really wanted to get to know you, I wouldn't just measure your height and color and eye color and, you know, whatever. So the point is that this is what happened to science is that it became, and this led to the second scientific revolution we'll get into, but it became focused solely on the outer appearances, on the packaging, and it forgot all about life, we could say. So what we have in a nutshell, and the reason this second scientific revolution is so, well, revolutionary, but also so important, is that we've ended up not only with with a general science of the dead world, what Aristotle called natura naturata, we've also ended up with a medical science or a healthcare science that is based on death, not on life. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Rudy Vesbor. Rudy has been studying and practicing homeopathy, Heilkunst, and romantic science healthcare for more than two decades. He has extensive clinical experience in the application of this rational system of identifying and removing underlying causes, particularly those relating to complex and chronic cases. Rudy has written several books providing new insights based on his research and clinical experience. Sharing his knowledge, he has lectured in many countries, including Canada, the US, the UK, and throughout Europe. From 1993 to early 2001, he served as the director of the British Institute of Homeopathy, Canada. Seeing the need for a more comprehensive education and training in Heilkunst, he established the Hanuman College for Heilkunst and the School for Romantic Science and Healthcare. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoy the conversation between Paul and Rudy as they discuss the second scientific revolution. Hello, everybody. Before we get into the podcast today, I have a very special life-transforming offer. I have created a three-day Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop that is perfect for Living 4D subscribers and listeners. I have broken up the three-day workshop to enhance your learning experience. My upcoming Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop will be conducted over the span of several weeks so that you don't have to do too much training at once and you have time to integrate what you learn between training sessions. I will offer day one on June 30th, the second day of training, July 14th, And to conclude the three days of training, we will meet on July 29th, where I'm offering a powerful day of practicing Czech life process alchemy with me to facilitate your own healing, spiritual growth, and to integrate all that was taught in the previous two days of training. Day three of the workshop combines an on-learning option with the option to attend live at our beautiful home in the mountains of Fallbrook, California. Check Life Process Alchemy is a structured system to help not just the coach, trainer, therapist, or doctor, but to help anyone who is genuinely interested in their own healing. Check Life Process Alchemy is a very powerful system for personal, professional, and spiritual growth and helps anyone identify the actual cause of their own physical, emotional, or mental symptoms or any patient or client's symptoms. After many years of studying alchemy and different systems of alchemy, I found that there were too many contradictions between the systems of alchemy to be a reliable means of addressing the spectrum of physical, emotional, mental, relationship, social, or spiritual challenges effectively. I took it upon myself to spend countless hours researching, studying, practicing, and investigating how to create an integrated system of alchemy that worked effectively and consistently. By integrating Carl Jung's and Rudolf Steiner's concepts of alchemy with classical alchemy concepts, I was finally able to create a system that includes the key physiological and psychological control systems that directly affect the human body, emotions, mind, and soul. I have now tested my Czech Life Process Alchemy system for many years and have taught it privately to therapists and with my life coaching clients, and it produces accurate results every time. A few years ago, I was the keynote speaker for the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine's 30-year anniversary and offered a two-day Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop to seasoned Oriental medical doctors, acupuncturists, students of Oriental medicine, and a variety of other healthcare professionals. It was very well received, and the most common comment I got was, why have I been studying and practicing all these years and nobody has ever taught us how to get to the actual cause of people's problems like this? 
Not only did the students in my workshop learn a lot of very practical approaches to their patient work, they learned a lot about themselves, which was quite enlightening for them, and I'm sure it will be for each of you too. This workshop will help you to understand how spirit creates and embodies itself through our mind, elemental forces, our physiology, regulatory systems, emotions, and the circumstances of our life. You will learn how to identify the actual causes of psychophysical imbalances and how to balance, heal, and grow yourself spiritually. You will learn how to guide yourself, life coaching clients, or patients through the Czech Life Process Alchemy process and the stages of healing that I teach. Practicing Czech Life Process Alchemy will facilitate conscious awakening and offer you greater freedom in life in a simple but dynamic format. You will learn a structured system of self or patient assessment, progression, awareness training, and behavioral change that is highly complementary to other holistic coaching therapies and training techniques and is ideal for all Czech trained professionals. Czech Life Process Alchemy uses key principles of alchemy, physiology, Jungian depth psychology, the four functions of consciousness, and the assessment of an individual's life story. Check Life Process Alchemy shows you how to resolve root causes of psychophysical challenges and facilitate anyone's ability to accomplish their dreams or goals for health, abundance, and life. As I mentioned earlier, the training will be conducted over three separate days online with the option to join me in person for the practice and integration training on day three. Within the first two days of online training, June 30th and July 14th, I will give you simple practical homework exercises to orient you to the practice of Czech Life Process Alchemy in your daily life or practice it with your clients and patients. Day 3, July 29th, you can choose to come to do the integration and practice training live or attend online. During day three, I will draw from students in class to demonstrate how to use your Czech Life Process Alchemy training and the principles of Czech Life Process Alchemy to solve real health, mental, emotional, or life challenges. Due to the personal, social, and cultural issues we're all facing in the world today, I felt compelled to offer each of you this opportunity to learn very powerful healing, stress reduction, and spiritual growth methods that really work. I feel this is important training, so I'm offering you the three-day training event for the same price I normally charge for my two-day workshops. I have created 17 three- to four-minute videos to introduce you to the concepts of Czech Life Process Alchemy so you can see if it resonates with your soul and you'd like to attend. They will be released progressively as the workshop approaches, and you can see each of them that have been released at the workshop sign-up page or follow me on my Instagram channel at paul.check. Remember that C-H-E-K, at paul.check. The introductory videos are in the Reels section. To register for my upcoming Czech Life Process Alchemy workshop, go to mailchi.mp forward slash paulcheck forward slash C-L-P-A. That's mail, C-H-I dot M-P forward slash Paul, C-H-E-K forward slash C-L-P-A. Once again, that's mailchi.mp forward slash Paul, C-H-E-K forward slash C-L-P-A. I'm super excited to have as many of you in this training as possible and also super excited to have as many of you here live at our Rainbow House as possible so we can share a lot of amazing insights and ahas and get clear together and go off into the world and do our best to make it a better place for everybody. Well, I'm excited to have Rudy Vespor back. I'm sure many of you listened to my first podcast with Rudy on homeopathy, which was fantastic and got a very positive response. I had Uh, many, many comments from all over the world asking for his help and saying how much they like the podcast. So I invited Rudy back to talk about what Rudy describes as the second scientific revolution, which I think you're all going to find very, very interesting. I know I'm very interested in what Rudy has to say on this. So Rudy, welcome back. Well, it's good to be back, and thank you for inviting me back to talk about this topic, which is really a passion of mine, and uh, you'll see as we un- uh, as it unfolds why, but uh, I'm really happy to be able to talk about it. Yeah, I'm excited too. I looked at the uh, handout or you know document you put together. It was very well illustrated, and I don't know uh, how much of that or all of that can be made available in the show notes. I'll 
have to leave Penny to the technical issues of that, but I'm hoping we can share that so people can get all the diagrams. But, um, you know, I, I think from our previous con uh, conversations, it's clear, and I agree, we need to return to natural science. So maybe we could start with you giving an overview of what natural science is and what you feel the second revolution is or needs to be and why. Well, the term natural science um, is an ambiguous one simply because, of course, uh, everybody uses it. But the question is, what exactly constitutes natural science? And this is getting to the heart of the whole issue of what the second revolution, scientific revolution is all about, is that from the side of the conventional science as we know it, natural science is simply studying uh, what I would call the dead world. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, it's, it's what Aristotle, who actually came up with this, he was the first natural scientist, you could say, he for, came up with this distinction, which has uh, existed up until maybe about 100, 150 years ago in, uh, in science, this distinction between what he called nature, natured, meaning simply the outer appearances, the form, you see a tree, you see a tree, you see a car, you see a car, you see a person, I see you, you know, you're such and such height and weight and build and, you know, everything. Yeah. Um, this is called the outer appearances. This is the nature as it presents itself in its forms. But he said there is another nature, which is behind the form, which he called natura naturata, or nature naturing, or nurturing. And this is the living moving, essential aspect of nature. So you could say that if someone gave you a box uh, for a present with nice wrapping paper on it, and you opened it all up, and whatever was in the box, you just set aside as of no importance and focus on the box and the wrapping paper and said, well, thank you very much for <laughs> beautiful wrapping paper and this box. That's in essence natura naturata, which is this kind of uh, form nature, this outer form, outer appearances. And so for Aristotle, of course, we have to deal with both aspects of natural science. But what happened, and this is partly why we have the second scientific revolution, what happened is that we lost this understanding and this connection to the internal essence, the natura naturans, the, the, the kind of living essence of the form. And it was like me looking at you and adding you up and adding all the chemicals and, you know, uh, the, the weight and the height and saying, well, that's Paul Check. Well, that's not Paul Check. That's the outer form Paul Check comes in. The wrapper. Yeah, the wrapper, the, the the paper, you can get dressed up really nicely or not, or, you know, whatever. You present yourself, the persona. Um, but the real Paul Cech, the soul spiritual being, is not in the form. It's manifest and reflected in the form, but that's not you. If I really wanted to get to know you, I wouldn't just measure your height and color and eye color and, you know, whatever. So the point is that this is what happened to science, is that it became, and this led to the second scientific revolution we'll get into, but it became focused solely on the outer appearances, on the packaging, and it forgot all about life, we could say. So what we have in a nutshell, and the reason this second scientific revolution is so, well, revolutionary, but also so important, is that we've ended up not only with, with a general science of the dead world, what Aristotle called natura naturata, we've also ended up with a medical science or a healthcare science that is based on death, not on life. Mm. And its function is not to create health, its function ultimately is to manage death. 
Because when you're dealing with the outer form, you're dealing with the world of the first scientific revolution, which we all know about, Galileo and uh, Descartes and you know all of these people, um, Newton. Um, what they've done is they've created the laws of the outer physical nature. Okay. But that world is subject to, as uh, Newton pointed out, the second law of thermodynamics, which is it dies. It's, it's in the process of dying. Okay, it's always dying. The earth eventually is just going to die, disappear. And that's true as far as the physical outer form is concerned. But that is not true when it comes to um, life, to the inner essence, the world of life. It is not subject to the second law of thermodynamics. It's subject to a whole host of different laws. And those laws, if you understand them, take you into the true world of health, of life, of true health care, and true medicine. And that is all about life, just as in scripture, you know, Jesus says, I am life, I am the light, I am the life, I am the way. And it's not about death, but everything on the conventional medical side is all based on death. If you don't do this, you'll die. They don't tell you how you can live. They just tell you, do this or you'll die. Um, if you don't, you know, inject your child with this, your child will die. Um, it's, it's a very negative death-dealing system. It's not about, you know, I don't teach you about nutrition in medical school. They don't teach you about how to go out and, you know, get proper exercise and live proper life in order to, you know, uh, live a meaningful life. No, it's just all drudgery. You see that around you in terms of the, you know, the um, economic system we have and the political system. It's all drudgery. It's all negative. It's all compression, uh, control, all of that. So what happened is roughly about um, 1400s uh, when we had this first scientific revolution in Europe in Western uh, civilization culture, we lost, finally, we lost, as Steiner calls it, the second fall, we lost connection to the inner essence of life. So all we could see was the outside. So we ended up creating a science from that, a very valuable science as far as the outer world is concerned, but it ended up creating a science purely of quantity, of appearances, of measurement, calculation, measure how much this weighs. You know, when you went to um, high school, probably, I think everybody goes through this, I still remember it, and we studied biology. And the one thing that stuck in my mind about biology, two things. One, it was all about chemistry. I wonder what has that got to do with biology? The second is we were studying Dead things. A selected animal, which was a frog. So, of course, you know, the, the famous experiment, you got this frog and you had to cut it up and you see all the organs. What's that got to do with life? You know, what did that tell you about the frog? It's We end up with the same in the medical school system, so-called anatomy and physiology. So what anatomy do you get? You get dead anatomy. It's just the liver's here and the heart's there, and, the, and then you get a dead physiology, which is either all about chemistry or some form of physics. Well, the, the heart pumps the blood through the body. Well, it's nonsense. The heart doesn't pump the blood. The blood in the fetus is moving even before the heart shows up in the fetus. So the heart is not necessary for pumping blood. It has a different function. So the point is that we get this dead anatomy, dead physiology. Okay. But that comes out of the fact that all you can see is the outer form. Oh, I can see the liver, I can see the heart, I can see the, the, uh, the heart pumping, supposedly, and I can see the blood moving. Therefore, we just get this material, mechanical, chemical view of the world. So what happened is that the Greeks didn't have this. If you go back to Plato, and Aristotle, they had a very profound understanding of what Aristotle called this living essence of nature. Okay, now Plato 
went one step beyond Aristotle. So Aristotle is a natural scientist, but Plato is a spiritual scientist. And Plato is not well understood because most of his works were lost. The ones we have are actually not the most important ones. What Plato in essence said, and this is what the Neoplatonists in the medieval times uh, taught us, Plato basically said, there's a world of ideas. Now for Plato, the Greek word idean is not, oh, I have an idea, let's go watch a movie. That's not what Plato's talking about. What he's talking about is an archetypal product of the mind of God, if we want to call it, or the creator. And that archetype is like an idea in your head for making something. Oh, I have an idea. I'm going to make a spaceship. No one's ever seen one before, but you have in your mind, you have this idea. And that idea, that archetype results in you producing a spaceship. Or let's say Steve Jobs with the idea for a personal computer. You know, no one ever seen this before. Or the iPhone. Everybody uses it now, but it's totally revolutionary. So these archetypes exist in the spiritual world. So the iPhone archetype exists in the spiritual world. Everything that was, is, and will be exists in the spiritual world. That's Plato's spiritual science. And, and Rudolf Steiner picked up on that. And so basically, people, geniuses, get an inspiration. Where did Steve Jobs get the idea for an iPhone? Well, he, he got it through, we could say, creative inspiration and then developed it through creative imagination. So all of that, Plato and Aristotle understood and was part of Greek science, okay? But by the 1400s, it was lost. Human consciousness had changed to the point where it could not see into the essential, the super sensory world anymore, okay? We lost that, and we focused on the immediate world. So now the success of the first scientific revolution, it was a big success. I mean, it was massive in terms of our ability to understand and manipulate the world of form, of appearances. Send a man to the moon, supposedly, if we did or we didn't, but supposedly, you know, look at all the technology. You're talking to me on this, you know, technology. That wasn't possible before. Uh, It's just astounding how much came out of that first scientific revolution. As a result of the success of that first scientific revolution, roughly around the beginning of the 1700s, the real top scientists, thinking scientists, decided that they were going to try to crack the mystery of life, okay? because they knew this had nothing to do with life. Now, of course, they've got this model which was wildly successful. And even by then, it was wildly successful. Of course, since then, it's become even more so. But even back then, it was quite impressive with uh, Newton's laws and, you know, Lavoisier and the chemistry, etc. They decided to tackle the whole problem of life. The problem there was that they tried to use the same methodology of chemistry and physics and apply it. So they started looking for, well, where is life in the human body? Oh, it's in the nerves. It's in the blood. It's in the muscles. It's in the, you know, you can run electric current through the body. Oh, look, the muscles move. Oh, that must be where where the life impulse is. But by about the middle of the um, 18th century, it became clear that they were getting nowhere. Okay. They, they were not cracking the code. And so what emerged out of that was an attempt to develop a different approach to life. And this is what we call the Romantic Movement. Okay. Now, for most of us, the Romantic Movement was about a bunch of poets wandering around and you know singing songs and, and uh, the arts and romantic painting and all of this. This was not the essence of the romantic movement. The essence of the romantic movement was to use the arts to develop a method to get into nature, to get past the veil of the outer appearances into the essence, into the inner sanctum, let's put it that way. And the keystone for that was 
prior to that, um, Francis Bacon. And second, at that time, launching it was uh, Goethe in, in Germany. Now, most people see Bacon as a mechanist, and he's the essence of the scientific method. You know, you study things, and you catalog things, and you quantify things, and you tally up things. But that was not Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was, you could say, um, connected to the old platonic impulse. And the essence of what Francis Bacon taught was that unless you approached an inquiry with an archetype, a platonic archetype, which he called the dry light of reason, the sicum, lumen sicum or something, unless you had that, you would get nowhere. You would just be an empiricist. Well, let's test this. Let's throw this at the wall and see if it sticks. Let's try this. Let's try that. He said the only valid scientific inquiry, science, rational inquiry, would be one that was guided by this light of reason, which is this platonic archetype. Now, how do you get that? Well, through inspiration. It comes to you. You open yourself up to the spiritual world and you get this inspiration, you know, whether the Einsteinian light bulb lights up above you and, and all the cartoon characters. Oh, you know, or one day you just have this idea. Where did it come from? And why did it come to you, etc.? But this was Francis Bacon. So they've taken his name in vain in the sense that they've just said, well, let's just try empirically. That's what medicine is right now. It's empiricism. Let's try this drug, see what the effect is. But there is no idea behind it. There is no rational guidance from the supersensible world behind it. So it is purely dead. It's about dead, dead matter and, and death. So Francis Bacon had this idea. Goethe brought a different idea, which was we need to connect with nature using a capacity that has to do with the same thing that artists use. That's why he was a poet and a writer, because he was trying to develop this capacity. So that capacity today we would call telepathy, empathy. Uh, he called it participative consciousness. So I'm able to have a conversation. And the word conversation, like we're doing right now, means turning together. Now, what is turning together? Well, for Steiner, it would be the, uh, the chakras, okay? The chakras are turning together. So the reason you and I can have a, a good, maybe even very good conversation is because our chakras are turning together. And we kind of, I've done talks with other people and their chakras were not turning the way mine were turning, meaning, <laughs> you know, it kind of were just not really talking about the same thing. And so this turning together that Goethe came up with was because he brought the artistic side, what we would call the right brain, you know, right. to, to the conversation, to the table. And in doing that, he developed a whole science in his chromatology, in his um, pleomorphism. Color, color science. Color science, uh, pleomorphism, this idea of the archetypal plant, very platonic. And he was able to penetrate the veil. Okay. Now, becoming more, if we become more specific, we would then say, well, what's that got to do with uh, health or medicine or health care? Well, what has to do with, what it has to do with is, what is science of life other than about life? And what is health about anything other than about life? Right. <laughs> and or death or how to avoid or prolong or, you know, uh, maintain a, a healthy state while you're on the earth. So where the rubber meets the road in terms of a science of life, which we call romantic science, because that's what it was, a science of life, is in healthcare and medicine. Okay. Now, as a result of the 
uh, you could say the emergence of romantic science, and at the same time, as a result of the kind of bankruptcy of the attempt to apply the, you know, the old methods of physics and chemistry to to life, or the methods of death to life, we had um, a real crisis around the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, a crisis in medicine. And that crisis was all about the fact that the premier philosopher of Western philosophy tried to approach this whole problem of life. And he came to the conclusion that we will not know anything about the world except what we can see through our senses. So that means that we're condemned to never knowing anything about anything beyond what we can measure, calculate, weigh, etc. And basically uh, cutting off this whole part that Plato and Aristotle and um, and Bacon and others and Goethe had attempted. Who was the philosopher? Uh, Kant. Oh, Emmanuel. Kant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Immanuel Kant basically said, "Medicine is not a science." Now, medicine means healthcare, anything to do with you know the 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 issue of life can never be scientific. Now that was a death blow to all those who held that we could know rationally, because that's what science means, rationally, not just, oh, I'm guessing, or, you know, try this, or empiricism. It was a death knell to all those who held that, well, we should be able to know rationally the laws of, of life. We should be able to rationally be able to manipulate them and use them to our benefit, etc. But Kant basically said no. However, he opened the door on one of his works and he said, if it were possible, and maybe it is, he said that would be an adventure of reason, meaning it would require such an effort that no one had ever undertaken before. And this is where Goethe came in and he basically said to Kant, he said, I'm going to undertake that adventure of reason. So along with Goethe, and several other people who are not well known, other than perhaps Hahnemann, because of his link to homeopathy, but the others are not well known. What emerged out of that was a veritable scientific, second scientific revolution. Why? Because out of it came a whole different system of laws and principles, a whole different system of operation rationally that had nothing to do directly with the first scientific revolution. So now what we get out of that, you could say, is a living anatomy. So if you think of what's a living anatomy, think of the um, thickness that emerged out of the United States with osteopathy. Then you get chiropractic, then you get craniosacral, you get uh, Bowen therapy, you know, it could go on and on. So that's living anatomy, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Not dead anatomy, you know, or just like the, 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 all the pictures of the muscle groups. Yeah, they, you have to know that. But the whole point about manipulation and moving and pressure points and everything else, all that has to do with understanding the living nature of the life force and the movement of the life force. So for example, I could go to a network chiropractor, which they should stop using that word chiropractor because network chiropractor doesn't do the traditional chiropractor. I know, it's always been a paradox for me. So he can just go in a very light touch to a particular pressure point, and suddenly you get a dramatic result. Now, that's no different than a homeopath giving a remedy, and suddenly you get the disappearance of a headache or a pain just goes away. It's like, how is that possible with a nothing, with an almost nothing? <laughs> so we have a living anatomy, but we also have a living physiology.
So not this dead physiology that I had to study of chemistry and physics and, you know, it's really biochemistry. It's dead. There's nothing about life in there. But a living physiology emerges out of the romantic movement. It also emerges out of uh, Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy. And it emerges out of Wilhelm Reich's work with orgone energy. And if we put all that together, we get the emergence of a rational, true scientific system of natural science. But now, natural science that includes Aristotle's natura naturans, the essence. It doesn't throw away the form because you still have to understand how the muscles and bones and, you know, how things move. And you still have to understand a certain amount of the chemistry. But we can now introduce all sorts of concepts that have to do with life, not the dead part of us, but the living part of us. What we could say more the etheric body and the astral body and the mind. And so that's why this revolution, this what I call the second scientific revolution, is so important, so monumental. But not only that, because as I see it, it's the only thing that's going to save us as the old healthcare system collapses. As bad as it was, it's going to be even worse when it collapses. But to be fair, we don't have on the natural health side, if we want to call it alternative medicine or natural health side, we don't have a scientific system. We're all empiricists when it comes to it. Oh, well, I learned how to do this. And if you, if you bend this and push this pressure point, and there is no science underneath the natural health system, the natural health field. There's no science underneath the conventional medical system, except the science of physics and chemistry. But when it comes to the actual medicine in terms of therapeutics, it's all empiricism, blind empiricism. Let's just run a trial and uh, see if this, uh, this substance uh, kills this nerve or if it gets rid of this symptom. And you run all these clinical trials and everything. This is what in the 80s came to be called evidence-based medicine. But there's no laws behind it. There's no uh, understanding of the deeper nature of life and uh, internal functioning. And it's all about just, if we do this, this will happen. It's, it's a kind of empirical blindness, so pure empiricism. So there's no science there either, in, in the sense of science meaning the laws, operative laws, other than that relate to uh, the bones or surgery. Sur surgery is more about, you know, the, the dead part of you and, and those laws apply, the chemistry and the, and the, the physics. But no, there's no science there. Now, this sci second scientific revolution gave us, back in Hahnemann's time, with his, uh, his uh, compatriots, Dr. Brown in England, Dr. Rushlaub and uh, Hufeland in Germany, along with Goethe, and all those people knew each other, um, they gave us, in essence, the foundation, just like Copernicus and Galileo and Taco de Bray, they gave us the foundation of the first scientific revolution. Back then, almost 200 years ago, over 200 years ago, they gave us the foundation. Now, since then, it's been developed by others, but, you know, that would take it. But what's important to understand is the that there was a foundation laid and, and what's involved in that. So, Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? 
Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in magnesium breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research and science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. This month, by optimizers have a special gift with purchase offer. When you buy a three-month supply of Magnesium Breakthrough, you not only save 25%, you also get a free gift of a bottle of Masszymes and a bottle of P3OM. And when you purchase a five-month supply of Magnesium Breakthrough, you save 30% and get free bottles of Masszymes, P3OM, and HLC. An incredible offer no matter how you slice it. To take advantage of this special offer now, go to magbreakthrough.com forward slash living 4D. That's magbreakthrough.com forward slash living 4D. Enjoy. A couple of thoughts. Um, wouldn't traditional Chinese medicine fall into the natural medicine approach since they're dealing with the flow of qi and life force energy and looking at how the systems are interacting real time as a living system, not yes. prescribing dead drugs and, and so much the surgical point. But it yes. seems to me they they were really in the study of life as how nature breathed and moved and, and went through its maturation cycles. And, you know, the stages of the caterpillar becoming the butterfly are very kind of Chinese medicine oriented, right? Yes, absolutely. And, um, this takes us to, you could say, this distinction I always feel needs to be made, and it's often not made, between in, in romantic science and, and, and um, this, this kind of uh, new science of life, between regimen and medicine. Okay, now this is really, uh, when we talked about Hahnemann, this is really the genius of Hahnemann is that up until Hahnemann's time, everything was what we could call regimen. Now, what is regimen? Regimen, even back in, in the times of the Greeks, even the uh, Ayurvedic uh, so-called medicines, not medicine in the true sense, or Chinese medicines, not medicine in the true sense, all regimen. Now, what is regimen? Regimen is working with the body's natural healing capacity. Okay, the body has internally a natural regenerative healing ability. So everything you do in terms of exercise, sunshine, uh, you know, diet, um, water, drinking, hydration, uh, and yeah, uh, and add it. You can add in uh, the Ayurvedic approach to it because that's a particular approach that came out of the Indian culture. You can add the Chinese uh, approach in terms of acupuncture, uh, moxibustion, uh, and the, and some of the uh, you know dietary advice that they had. Um, basically, these systems were same with the Hippocratic uh, physicians in the Greek times. They were all focused on supporting the body doing what it knows how to do removing blockages uh, and building up the strength so that the body can carry this out. That's regimen. Until Dr. Hahnemann's time, 
there was no medicine. Okay, now by medicine, I mean the something working directly off of the generative power. Okay, so you have, this was Hahnemann's genius as well, as he understood, and the German culture understood this, because he got it from uh, others. There, is, there are two parts to your life force. The first part is this natural healing capacity. The second part is the part that allows you to generate and regenerate, not just heal, but generate and regenerate. So in nature, if the salamander loses its tail, it'll regenerate a tail. Okay, we don't, we can't do that, but we eat the liver. You can take part of the liver and regenerate the whole liver with that. The, you can make a baby that way. Okay, now the natural healing power doesn't make the baby. It has to, this generative capacity. You see it in the um, mitosis, the uh, splitting of the cell. So there's these two sides. Now, the question is, if one side is affected, what happens? And if the other side is affected, what happens? So this gets us to the heart of the, the scientific revolution. So basically, what Hahnemann and his compatriots understood was that initially, let's take a healthy person, okay? Somebody's healthy, there's no problems, you know, it's a thought experiment, as Bacon would say. And this person uh, doesn't exercise as much anymore, he's not eating as well, and he starts, you know, living a dissolute lifestyle. So what happens? His sustentive power, his maintaining his natural uh you could say healing power basically goes into an imbalance. Okay. And out of that imbalance, the body tries to restore the balance and you get certain symptoms. Oh, I feel weak. I've got a headache. Uh, I got a skin rash, etc. The body is trying to literally get back to balance. So you come along as the physician, because that's the Greek term physis, which simply means the healing, natural healing power. The physician, the person with knowledge of the operation of the physis, he comes in and says, oh, you need to go on a fast, uh, you need to rest, you need to meditate, you need to go to the temple and uh, you know say some prayers, and you need to exercise a bit more, and then suddenly you come back to yourself and you're healthy again. But at some point, if you don't look after yourself, if you keep on this dissolute path, you eventually get to a point, and this is a biological reality, where you cross a threshold. You literally shift into a different part of your functioning. And that different part is this generative capacity. Okay. This capacity to generate is protected by your normal natural healing power. It's like a bodyguard, you know, keeps all the toxins away, uh, makes sure things stay balanced, etc. But eventually, if you get weak enough, it can damage the generative power. Okay. Now, when you damage the generative power, it's a little bit like becoming pregnant, okay, except in the negative sense, you become pregnant in a negative sense. Now, if a woman becomes pregnant, no amount of, you know, change of diet, exercise, except in terms of poisons and other things, but in a general sense, no amount of diet, exercise, sunshine, or whatever is going to change the fact that you're pregnant. <laughs> pregnant. Otherwise, uh, there would be no abortion business. Yeah, exactly. So the body is very protective of this generative capacity. Okay. But once that, that barrier is breached, a bit like the placental barrier between the, the fetus and the mother, once that's breached, then a lot of damage occurs. Okay. So, or the blood brain barrier, you know, the, uh, those barriers are there for a reason. And what happens then is a damage akin to a negative pregnancy that cannot be changed by any amount of regimen. Okay, 
So I was just listening to the radio on my way back this morning from uh, an errand. And this lady was talking, this doctor was talking about what they do to help post-traumatic stress disorder victims. And she's saying, well, uh, we provide them with counseling, uh, a, a safe environment, you know, describing all of this kind of psychotherapy, supportive, et cetera. And the man says, well, what happens out of that? She says, well, we can temporarily, uh, you know, get them out of their panic or out of their confusion or whatever, temporarily. Now, why temporarily? Because nothing they do is removing the causation on the side of the generative power. These are like pieces of shrapnel in a soldier sitting there and you can't get at them because they're near vital organ or whatever, you just you have to leave them. And that's the, the difference between medicine, which has to do with this, how do we fix the generative power? which is a whole different question from how do we support the natural healing power, which is regimen. So if we understand that there is this distinction, then you can also understand that with the exception of Hahnemann, all of the natural healing field is about regimen. Okay, it's all about regimen, just making things better, supporting, there is nothing other than what Dr. Hahnemann provided that I have been able to find uh, in my 30 years working in the natural health field that addresses how do you fix the generative power problem, okay? And that is with this uh, law of similars because two different laws apply, okay? On the regimen side, if you're eating too much and you're getting sick, don't eat so much. If you're getting dehydrated, drink more water. If you're, you know, getting aggravated by something, avoid that something. If you're too stressed, step back and don't do so much. That's all the law of opposites. But on the generative power side, it's a totally different law. It's a law of similars. If you have, uh, let's say, um, a generative power impingement, a piece of shrapnel, that has a vibrational frequency similar to arsenic, okay, you give that person a minute infinitesimal dose of arsenic. Really, you're giving just simply the arsenic frequency, okay? It destroys, that's what Hahnemann discovered, it destroys the arsenic impingement arsenic-like impingement in your generative power, and it's gone. Now you don't have that problem anymore. Let's take the case of addictions. I've treated quite a few people with addictions. So you have an addiction to whatever. In my case, it was sugar. Okay, Highly addicted to sugar because it's all self-medication. Right? When you're sick in some way or other, whatever you're addicted to is because it makes you feel good. Yeah. <laughs> There is nothing addictive about any substance except that it makes you feel good, then it becomes addictive, okay? It's like saying, well, guns don't shoot people. People use guns to shoot other people. So cocaine's not addictive, uh, sugar's not addictive, alcohol's not addictive, except if it makes you feel really good, then it becomes addictive, okay? So in my case, sugar became addictive. And if you try to detox these people, go to a retreat, uh, you know, keep them away from sugar, let's say in my case, uh, put them on a desert island where they don't get access to sugar and, and you know, provide them with healthy food and exercise about it, whatever, and they come back, eventually they're going to fall into the addiction again. The recidivist rate is very high. There may be a few cases where someone, for whatever reason, you know, and I can explain why, doesn't. But the vast majority, it's like smoking. Like I had a boss who said, uh, there's no problem quitting smoking. I've done it a hundred times. And so how do you get rid of the addiction? You get rid of all of those factors on the generative power side that are the causation behind the sickness you have that allows that thing to make you feel better. It's 
temporarily makes you feel better because no one can sustain feeling bad for any length of time. And so you do whatever makes you feel better. And so I've treated people going by removing all of those blockages on the generative power side and the addiction disappears okay. forever. It's not like, you know, oh, you just have to avoid the temptation. There is no more temptation. It's not there anymore. So this is the, uh, these are the kinds of things like the law of opposites versus the law of similars that we need to understand. We also need to understand that we don't really have a dynamic physiology. Okay. We don't have an understanding within the natural health field of what constitutes how this living human being operates not just in terms of the chemistry and the physics, but in terms of the, the things that Steiner talks about, for example, the soul, the spirit, uh, the, um, the astral body, the etheric body, the, the physical body, not the material body, but the physical body. All of these things are things that allow you and help you to apply you could say the therapeutics that come out of this uh, romantic revolution, the second scientific revolution, but it's not there. It's not really being taught except in maybe anthroposophical medicine or, or you know, uh, medical ergonomists out of, uh, out of uh, Reich's uh, work, et cetera, and to some extent homeopathy and, and what I do. But the, the essence of that dynamic physiology is not taught. Nobody understands it. I mean, you do because you've read Steiner and, you know, you've, you've read many of these other people. And so you have an understanding, but your average practitioner out there doesn't have that. Yeah. There's a few thoughts I wanted to just share before they're out of context. You know, back to the issue of kind of the materialistic medicine, as you know, it's getting worse and worse because what was you know, many years ago, around 2000, I did three years of training in functional medicine with one of the pioneers of functional medicine. And I found it gave us a lot of data, but I used it differently. Most people use it, as you know, as a means of deciding what to prescribe. Yes, exactly. But for me, for example, if someone did a 24-hour cortisol rhythm test and I saw that they were low in three of the four tests, uh, at, you know, in the 24 hour cycle, you do it every, uh, what is it? You break the cycle into four. So 6am noon dot, dot, dot. And so you can see how the adrenal glands are responding. You can correlate that with the phase of the sun and how that's affecting the system. But for me, it was always, it just led me to saying, okay, I now need to look into what's going on in your life. That's producing the stress that's causing the system to respond such that I'm getting this data. You know, a lot of people, for example, get functional medicine tests and they'll come to me and they'll, you know, of course they come to me because they failed to get any results where they were going many times. And so they'll say things like, Oh, look, I've got this test and it shows I'm low on vitamin B6. I'm low on vitamin C. I'm low on vitamin D. And so the, the, the therapist that did the testing or the doctor, of course, says, well, we're going to give you a bunch of these vitamins. But then I test do tests on them and say, well, the first thing we got to do is find out if you have a fungal or a parasite infection, because you might just be feeding them and make them even stronger. And you're not really addressing why you have these vitamin deficiencies. So for me, functional medicine was basically a mechanism to take a deeper look that I could get through the chemistry to direct me to where to more carefully correlate okay, you've got a problem with your pancreas. That's the third chakra. Let me talk to you about what's going on in your life and your sense of self and, and related issues. And you, it always leads right back to core issues that have to be addressed or the functional medicine tests just play games because then you trick the adrenal glands with you know licorice root and pregnenolone and it makes you look like you're okay, but you haven't really actually addressed the problem so it, it kind of hearing you talk to me, it sounds like what you're referring to as the generative aspect really could be considered the soul. Is that correct? 
No, it's not the soul. It's it's just part of the vital force, the the power. The the soul, of course, is operative, you know, within that and around it. But the the, the issue, the generative power is simply a life force within you that uh, you could say comes from the cosmos, but is contained within, a, you know, the structure that is you. But the issue that you raise is probably one of the most critical issues. And that is namely the whole issue of causation versus symptomology. Okay. Um, first of all, the first step in addressing causation and symptomology is also understand this distinction between an imbalance of the sustentive power or regiminal problem versus an Im, uh, a disease of the generative power, which is degenerative, which is a different problem. It's a medical problem. Okay, so there's medicine and regimen, which we talked about. The second issue is Again, to go back to Aristotle, Aristotle wrote the treatise on causation, and we've lost that. So all we're left with is, I have a headache, and the uh, even in the natural health field, I'm not saying you, your example is a good one because you go beyond that even, but in the general, in the natural health field is, oh, well, um, it's caused by an inflammation of the meninges around the brain, and therefore we've got to give something anti-inflammatory, or we've got to calm the body down so the inflammation is not so much. And there's all sorts of things that can be applied, including acupuncture, Ayurvedic, uh, meditation, you name it, all sorts of things. But it's all designed to calm this down. Now, if you want to drill down deeper, uh, yes, you can drill down to, well, you're overstressed. So let's address the stress. Now that will work if the problem is only on this side of the equation, the, the, the regiminal side of the equation. So your, your generative power is healthy, but you're just off balance because of stress. Oh, I just need a vacation. I need some meditation, take a trip you know, on the mountains, and I come back and I'm renewed and recharged because your generative power is not affected. However, if you have been damaged in your generative power, that regiminal work will only go so far. And not only only go so far, it will in a way mask the deeper problem that is in the generative power side. So let me give you an example of that. I had a, a woman, I think I mentioned this last time, but it's a really good one. I mean, it's one that really illustrated it for me. A woman who came to see me and um, she just came for an opinion. She didn't actually come initially for treatment, but she said, I just want to know an answer to one question. She said, I was really sick uh, five years ago. And I went to see a naturopath and a bunch of other people and, uh, I got rid of all my problems. That was great. And then uh, six months ago, I had a shock. You know, someone died or I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a significant shock. She said, all my symptoms came back. And now they're even worse. And everything we did before doesn't work anymore. So why not? Well, the problem was that she had a whole host of issues regarding the generative power, this, this uh, generative capacity. And those problems just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually with a shock or trauma, it weakened her sustenance side or healing power so much that it was able to explode again and manifest again. So then she went through treatment and we got rid of those generative power problems and got rid of the you know, the issue. So this is really causation. The, the question is always, what's the cause of the problem? Now, not only do we make the distinction, as I said, between is it an imbalance? You're not drinking enough water. You got too much stress, you, all of this. 
But is it also a problem on the generative power side? Well, that's not well known in the natural health field. And certainly even within homeopathy in general, it's not well known. But there are layers and layers of uh, causation when it relates to the generative power side. Because Aristotle talked about the exciting cause. So, oh, I ate this and it made me sick. I don't feel well. Well, the typical answer, don't eat it then. But on the other hand, if we're healthy, we should be able to eat almost anything. It might, you know, make us tired and it might, we might go, oh yeah, that, that took some of my energy away, but it shouldn't really disturb you that much. Um, look at uh, Rasputin, you know, taking all that arsenic that they fed him in, in Russia. Uh, I don't know if you know the history of Rasputin and the Russian royal family, but anyway, they tried to poison this guy. And he had a cast iron stomach, as it were, and it couldn't be poisoned. <laughs> Didn't matter how much arsenic they pumped into him. So the point is that if you have an exciting cause, it's easy. Oh, uh, you're too stressed or you got inflammation uh, on the brain. So let's address that. But that's the most superficial level of causality. The next level of causality is a remote uh, cause, as Aristotle caused it, which means you can't link it directly to to what your headache, let's say. But maybe, maybe it was because um, you know uh, you got out of a bad relationship three years ago, and now it's showing up with this other stressor. It's now manifesting as a headache. You know, it's like a something growing underground, and then eventually. <laughs> you know, shows up and it can be there. and We don't know about it. And then there's the, um, you could say, uh, the occasioning cause, which could be uh, just a, a shock or trauma specifically. Uh, and immediately, you know, uh, ever since I had uh, that concussion six months ago, I haven't felt well. And and you can make that connection. Oh, you know, yeah, I still have these headaches and I'm off and, you know, I feel a bit fuzzy. And OK, that's pretty obvious. And then there's the fourth level that what uh, Aristotle called the ultimate cause. Now, the ultimate cause takes us into the spiritual world. OK, and that takes us to the whole issue of karma. And so then. When you're talking about karma. That is really what's behind the levels of causation for the generative power. Okay, you came into this world already weakened as far as your generative power was concerned because of karmic factors. And then you add to that by getting a, an injection, by taking drugs, by you know having accidents and surgeries and emotional traumas. And all of these things then start to damage your generative power to a point where you can't get yourself out of the hole. You've got an addiction, you're post-traumatic stress disordered, you know, et cetera. So it's, a, it's very complex these days, unfortunately. Um, I had a, a case very recently uh, where I had a gentleman who had um, a prostate attack, a problem, uh, very severe. And um, it took me quite a lot to get him out of the hole, but I could only get him out of the hole and keep him out of the, you know, the surgical side um, and the drug side because uh, I understood many of these other levels of causation that were behind his particular immediate problem. But even then, it's, it's, it's a complex thing because everybody has built up so much karma. Now, within our system, you can treat for that karma, not just in this lifetime, but the kind of the karma, karmic load that you brought with you, the gene genealogical load, um, that manifests uh, as a result of karma, you brought all this with you. So this makes it even harder to just do things on the regimenal side with the law of opposites um, if we don't address the, the problems on the generative power side. Okay, so we have all of these things that need to be taken account of in a scientific revolution. 
that there is this relationship between these two sides. So that in the material that I sent you, that's what's called the indirect problem. So you get a problem, you get a problem, you get a problem, and eventually it flips, and now you're on the other side of the biological divide, and you're in a different world. And what works on this side of the biological divide is not going to help you on the other side of the biological divide. So you need a totally different uh, therapeutics, you could say, to address that side of the problem. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to be able to share this podcast with you, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about one of my secret methods for keeping me vital and strong, and that's Organifi's Balanced Probiotic Formula in capsules. Organifi Balanced Capsules gives your gut system the support it needs to help you feel better in many ways. I suspect by now you've seen one of the many excellent documentaries showing how essential the health of our microbiome is and how consuming the right probiotic bacteria can really help your body, emotions, and mind in many ways. Each dose of Organifi Balanced Capsules includes five of the most important probiotic bacteria for a healthy body, and Organifi guarantees 20 billion colony-forming units of probiotic bacteria per serving, which ensures that a significant amount of health-giving bacteria will make it through your stomach into your small intestine and colon where they can do their magic. Organifi's Balanced Formula supports GI health, supports you in having a healthy digestive system, probiotic replenishment, promotes gut flora diversity, supports healthy gut flora, maintains healthy gut balance, reduces bloating and gas and supports you in having regular bowel movements, which improves detoxification, helps you reduce or eliminate abdominal discomfort, improves digestion and absorption, supports your immune system and gives it the boost you need for a healthy immune response. To get your 20% L4D discount on Organifi Balance Formula and Capsules and support your health and vitality each day, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash check 20. That's Organifi dot com forward slash check 20. For your Living 4D discount on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. As an added bonus, you can use your check 20 discount code on all purchases and subscriptions and get 20% off. Feel free to visit the website for more technical information on the ingredients in Organifi Balance. Enjoy. A few things that I want to bring some clarity to. Uh, from what I know from clinical practice and what you're saying is that the regimental side, to me, if I synthesized it down to what is it in essence, it's really the conscious participation and the balancing of the elements of earth, water, fire, and air. Because ultimately, that's what regimen is about, if you take it right down to its core essence. The deficits in the regimental side, if I'm hearing you correctly, can damage the generative capacity, which means there has to be a flow between those two energies or, or systems. Yes, there is. So if we can say that the generative side relates to the regimen of balancing the four elements that make life force energy, because you have to have those four, you can't have life force energy, then though you say it's not specifically the soul, then it has to be spirit that's generative. What would be the medium that we're working with that creates the essence or the body of the generative faculty is what I'm missing. Okay. Okay. In, let's put it in what I would call scientific terms, because that really takes us to Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science, because he, he is a scientist par excellence in, in spiritual science. He's really Plato, you could say, Rita Vivas. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Um, so the etheric body, the life body, the dynamic body, that's the source of the generative power and the sustentive power, or the regiminal and you know generative side. Um, the astral body, which is connected to the soul, and the what he calls the ego or the I, um, which is connected to the spirit, those are not regenerative. Okay, um, how should I put that? Ask, the reason you have consciousness 
is because there's an intervention in the endless flow of life in your etheric body. If you just had endless flow of life, you'd be a plant. Yeah, you could regenerate whatever gets pulled off. Yeah, you just regenerate. So the fact that there's an intervention and, and, and a kind of a disruption of that endless flow means it's like building a dam on a river and creating power out of it means that the astral body is not a life force. It's a death force. Okay. Now that doesn't mean it's bad because you need a certain amount of death. Just like we have in the body, we have certain chemicals we call amines in small amounts, which are necessary for metabolism. But of course, too much, <laughs> not going to work. So the astral body is really uh, a death force and the eye is a death force so that we can have consciousness. So the generative power, the sustenance power, they're related to the etheric body. So that's why it's not connected to the soul spirit. However, the soul spirit are operating through and using the etheric body to uh, carry out activities, you know, to do things in this world, but also to have consciousness. And it's a, it's a, a balance uh, between the death forces and the life forces in order to maintain what we call health life uh, on this earth as, as long as possible. So you can't equate the soul spiritual to the, to the, um, to the generative power. It's actually going to uh, wear down the generative side of the etheric body eventually. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. I mean, I see how you're describing it, but the etheric body is ultimately the interface between the physical biochemical body that we have and the spirit and the soul above. So it is the interface, yes. You're right, it's the interface. Even Steiner himself, because I've been studying this extensively for the, the work I'm writing right now, describes the astral field or the astral function and, and thought as a death force. And he shows how the process of the brain and at the nerve blood junction, the act of thought in relationship to salt crystals, I'll make it simple for because it'd be very complex to explain the whole thing, is really causing a death force in the body. And that has a restructuring effect on the brain tissue itself. And, and of, of course, it reflects itself in gesture, posture, movement, speech. So the, the changing as a therapist, when I'm working with addiction and things like that, I have to look at the actual traumas and belief systems that have been adopted. And even in anthroposophic medicine, Steiner says, whenever you're dealing with a case of chronic illness, it's very important to identify what the patient's secret story is. Yes. And so here you're dealing with really what is more in the realm of spirit and soul interacting through the etheric and physical body. So to me, they're like the Tai Chi symbol. They're creating each other. So there's there's got to be work at both ends, because if you only work at the physical end, then you never actually get to the true etiology. Oh, no, absolutely. No, no, you have to work at all levels, physical, etheric, astral, and, and the, the level of the ego or the I. All of those levels matter. And but the from a scientific perspective, each level has to be approached somewhat differently. And um, so in regimen, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if, if you're thinking purely at the physical level, you would say, well, you need more exercise and sunshine, better nutrition, this and that and everything else. If you're looking at the etheric level, you would say, well, you know, uh, you need better nutrition, but you need nutrition that has life in it. So you go to biodynamic or organic, you need more light or sunlight, but you know you need uh, not mineral light direct from the sun, but you need the light that comes through walking through a forest. So that's a theoric regimen. Then you get to the astral level and you say, okay, how do we address the astral level? Well, you have to do things you love, things you resonate with, read books and watch movies that are resonant to you, etc. because uh, astral body is all about love. And then you get to the eye 
And then you have to uh, get into the whole issue of, uh, you could say, belief systems you mentioned. And that's a, a, an issue that Steiner addressed uh, through his epistemological works. And, and we, we would call that dynamic education. How do you address a belief system without simply replacing with another belief system? Right. And that's the whole problem of epistemology. How do you know what you know when you know it? And uh, how do you know truth or Christ's question? What is truth? So that is the big problem when it comes to, you could say, regimen at the level of those four bodies or four, four elements. On the medicine side, it's, there are four levels, again, but they're not well known because, of course, nobody outside of what I teach really understands them. Um, you have in the physical body, you have all the shocks and traumas that happen to you because it affects the generative power in this lifetime, injections, vaccinations, drugs, uh, surgeries, accidents, etc. cetera. Um, at the etheric body level, you have something that Hahnemann called chronic miasms. So these are inherited. You bring them in with you. So before you're even born, you're already loaded with a whole bunch of baggage and it weighs you down. Okay. Then you go to the astral body level and you have issues of illusions, delusions, addictions, and aversions. So you have all sorts of things that have to do with resonance and relationships that are in your unconscious mind that are in conflict. So, and you're not even aware of it, but it causes you to act certain ways and do stupid things and, uh, you know, uh, reject well, the relationship. It, it produces neurosis in Jung's term. Neurosis and psychosis, depending on whether you're in the upper or the nether being, as Steiner would say. Well, Jung would say that the neurosis is the attempt to alleviate the stress that if not alleviated yeah. through the neurosis will trigger a psychosis. Exactly. It gets down. It's The, the distinction there uh, that uh, Jung is making is similar to the distinction that um, we were making between the sustna power and the generative power. The distinction there is between what Steiner calls the upper man and the nether man. Mm. And the upper man is neurotic and the nether man is psychotic. <laughs> what a choice. <laughs> yeah. If the neurosis gets bad enough, it'll eventually trigger the psychosis. And, and Reich, is, uh, Reich has a lot to say about that as well. So the point is that at the astral body level, you, ne you need to have a therapeutics that can address those uh, issues. And again, uh, there is a therapeutic uh, modality that can do that. And finally, at the upper level of belief, okay, you basically come together, the regimenal and the medicinal come together in this dynamic education, which is ultimately this whole problem of Western philosophy of epistemology. How do we know what we know? And Steiner wrote a lot about that. He talks at pure thinking or living thinking or etheric thinking and the whole issue of imagination, inspiration, intuition. And then you have Goethe talking about it through his, uh, his Gemüt uh, lectures, etc. You have, um, you know, th this whole uh, Reich uh, contributes to it. So there's, that is the ultimate problem. But this brings up the issue of sequentiality, is that you have to start at the lowest level of disturbance, which is usually the most immediate and work your way up to the highest level. It's like systematically strengthening the person so that they can tackle the deeper, higher problems. If you try to go to those deeper, higher problems too fast, then like you would strengthen someone um, with uh, you know, a regimen and uh, diet, nutrition, exercise, other things before you would uh, tackle a big problem. You have to strengthen the whole capacity of the body to do that. Then you can go up and maybe talk to them about their problem, and then you can, you know, get them to see. But the thing is, there is a sequence that you have to work on, and that has to be part of a science that once we understand the living physiology, the dynamic physiology, 
once we understand the nature of disease and health, which comes out of this whole scientific revolution, as to exactly how this whole issue of the life force and health operates, then you can devise uh, a systematic therapeutic approach that everyone could agree to. So then it would be, if we had that understanding, you would have a gatekeeper who would say, almost like the family physician today, who would say, oh, you know what? After having taken your uh, amnesis, your case, you need to go see Paul Check about something because he's got the answer to your problem. Uh, or someone else comes in with se seemingly the same symptomology. You say, no, no, you need to go see the uh, network chiropractor. That's the first step in your treatment. And after that, then you take this step. Everybody gets a kind of individualized treatment based on this rational scientific understanding of how everything works. And then everybody plays their role instead of, unfortunately, we're all trying to fix problems based on a similar outward appearance. Okay, so if someone has a migraine, uh, there can be a thousand and one causations behind a migraine. And unfortunately, everybody, well, let's give a painkiller or let's give something to reduce the stress. That is not, you could say, an individualized treatment because it doesn't get at the underlying layer of causation or the chain of causation. But with this bigger understanding that was given to us in the second scientific revolution, we have a map, you could say, that allows us to basically identify the chain of causation. And by identifying the chain of causation, we can then systematically work on both sides, the regimenal side and the, gen you know, the uh, generative side by uh, sequentially working our way up the chain of causation. And eventually getting to a point we can tackle this big problem of belief. And the problem of belief is the ultimate barrier to seeing reality, you could say. Okay, because we that's what causes all the dissension is belief. Because once you have a belief, uh, you're void of knowledge. Yeah, it's a couple of things there. Um, one, what you've just described as the doctor saying you need to see Paul Check or you need to see the uh, acupuncturist or whatever, that's the model I built the entire Check Institute on. By the time someone graduates through the Check Academy, they have been trained how to identify when you need to refer to at least 19 different medical and allied healthcare professionals because I tell people in training, the body is far, far too complicated. And the whole construct that we've just been describing and talking about for any one of us to have the depth of knowledge we need in all the different areas, because you can spend your entire life studying endocrinology or spiritual science and be very void in your <clears throat> need for knowledge in these other areas. In my whole career, I've been always studying who does what well and how do I know when someone needs a Feldenkrais practitioner versus an Alexander practitioner versus traditional Chinese medicine versus homeopathy, et cetera? And because I, I, I learned from, you know, I built my career dealing with medical failures. So I kept running against these walls. And I would, the first thing I would always do is look at a case. And I mean, I would get medical files, multiple of them that were, you know, two and a half inches thick and weighed five pounds. And I'd have five years of material to look through. And what I would see is they'd see a neurologist who couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then they would send them to another neurologist. And this would happen eight times. They'd go to a chiropractor who then send you to another chiropractor. So they get caught in these belief systems and they are self-reinforcing. In other words, yeah, the same yeah. people keep, keep sending to the same people. And so the first thing that I would show my students is, look, there's obviously not going to be a chiropractic solution here. They've tried 10 chiropractors. So if it was a chiropractic solution, it would have been gone a long time ago. So we got to now say, okay, what systems are involved? And then we get into the neurology, the correlations between glands and organs, the chakra system, the mental emotional factors, the life trauma factors, the whole history, 
So it, it takes four years to train people to do all this because it takes a lot. And you have to develop yourself as a practitioner so that you're not just swapping ideas. You've got to do this work on yourself or you don't really know what you're guiding somebody into. Um, so <clears throat> there's that factor. Now, there's another factor that I want to bring up because I understand what you're saying, but it's it's often trickier than that. I'll give you an analogy. If somebody comes to me with regimental problems, and let's say it might be coupled with an addiction, like sugar. Um, as you know, change takes a lot of energy. So yes, you have to build them up. But oftentimes you have to come face to face. A good example is I've had many patients who I clearly identified had severe gluten intolerance. They may have even had Crohn's disease or any number of factors. But then when I tell them what's going on, they don't believe it. And then, or they, they think, oh, well, that's interesting. They go home and their father's a medical doctor and they say, oh, that's all bullshit. So the point I'm making is oftentimes you have got to climb up to the belief system because you cannot get a buy-in at the regimental level until you address both ends of it. And it makes it very tricky because sometimes you have to come face to face with these rigid belief structures that are in the way of an effective regimental structure. Another simple analogy is, you know, I've worked with a lot of, as you can imagine, very elite athletes, and some of them get very fixed ideas in their head. And I've had champion kettlebell athletes, for example, that were trained in the Russian system, which has almost no consciousness of orthopedics and the reality of orthopedics and what we would classically refer to as ergonomics or body position and biomechanics. So they've, they've got these bad, bad habits of swinging kettlebells and doing things in ways that are destructive, particularly to the lumbar spine. So then I say, okay, look, I can't just tell the person to do it this way because they're in a belief system. They're, they're, they're in a regimen that's attached to a belief system. So you can't change a person's weightlifting technique until you've addressed the belief system and the weightlifting technique is regimental. So my point is only that the structure system that you've talked about is good, but it's also real that you also sometimes have to play all levels of the keyboard. Yes, no, absolutely. And, and the point you're making is very valid. Uh, I didn't make a distinction that there are many levels of belief. Okay. Yeah, that's for sure. If you're talking about a belief that the Russian system is the best way or this system or that system, yes, that's what I call a low level of belief. And that you can actually tackle regimenally. Now, you can only tackle it if there's something that in scripture is called uh, trust. Of course, it's unfortunately translated as belief, but the, the word in Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew simply means trust or faith, depending on the context uh, grammatically. And so if a person is coming to you, the issue is, well, trust me, I know what I'm doing and you know, you just, I'm gonna show you. You can overcome that lower level belief simply by this idea of, well, I've studied a lot and I think this is destructive. So you know, if you want me to tr help you, you have to trust that I know what I'm doing. So that definitely, you can work at that level of belief. You can work at other levels of belief. I do that constantly with patients. I agree with you. But when I talk belief, I'm talking about the ultimate, the highest level of belief, a kind of presiding view of how the world operates. Yes, and religious dogma and things like that. Dogma, things like that. And that you can't address until you've removed all of these other things that are in effect contributing to that belief system, because that belief system comes from somewhere. You see, it doesn't just, you know, come down from the clouds onto you. You have it as a result of, and the point here I'm making is that if you address things causally, particularly on the uh, gener generative side, you can remove a lot of stuff that otherwise would become very complex. So by removing shocks and traumas, 
Suddenly this, this works better. Suddenly that works better. Suddenly the body is hydrating better. Suddenly the digestive is improving. And yet you haven't given anything specifically for that or whatever, but you're removing the underlying blockages, the causes for those original problems um, or a lower back problem, let's say, or a degenerative spine. So why is the lower back a problem and why is the spine degenerating there? Well, as you work your way through this causality and remove it, suddenly the spine improves. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need a chiropractor or a network or a, you know an osteopath or a Bowen practitioner. It just means that what they now do on the regimenal side will have far greater benefit because you've removed the underlying blockage so that when people go to a chiropractor to snap something back in place, and then it snaps out again. If you remove the underlying causation, it gets snapped back in place. It stays there. Yes. And so everything works better when the two sides are working in harmony. But the addressing the causation, certainly on the medicine side, is very powerful because it then, as you said, it feeds back into the regimenal side. It allows the regimenal side to work much, much better. And so the... All of this is part of a system which has emerged, that's the second scientific revolution. And, and you're certainly heading in that direction with your thinking and the way you approach things. It's just that there is something there that has never really been researched, never really been taught uh, in terms of how this uh, life uh, in nature works. And once we understand that, we bring in all the aspects, what you're doing, what uh, neuro, uh, osteopaths do, what uh, Chinese acupuncture and all these people do. You bring all that together, but they're operating within a rational system of laws and principles. And they can say, oh, that's why my thing works. So that's why, you know, uh, it doesn't work when I try to do it here because of this problem. And you get a, an insight, an understanding that allows everything to work much, much better when, when it's working according to this rational scientific understanding, just the way it does in the material world with the first scientific revolution. Hi, everybody. I'm sure grateful to have you on this journey with me and listening to the podcast and picking up new and interesting ways that we can all work together to make the world a better place for all living beings now and in the future. Today, I'm really excited to tell you about Paleo Valley's new wild-caught fish row. Have you ever tried wild-caught fish row? I grew up on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and each year during the salmon run, fish row was plentiful, and when I'd eat it, I could just feel my body saying yes and wanting more. And that is exactly what happens every time I use Paleo Valley's carefully freeze-dried, wild-caught fish row capsules. Fish row is an excellent addition to your daily health plan and is prized around the world by various cultures containing an array of beneficial nutrients you'd get with whole food fish. Paleo Valley's wild-caught fish row comes from fish caught by sustainably-minded fishermen committed to preserving fish runs for future generations, and it's super clean and healthy. It gives your body a great dose of easily absorbed omega-3 fatty acids, which are super important and helpful. In fact, a recent study found 68% of American adults are not consuming enough omega-3s, and 89% had levels in the dangerously low range associated with high cardiovascular risk. Omega-3 deficiencies can cause imbalances in the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio, causing things like unhealthy levels of inflammation, low energy levels, poor memory, joint discomfort, dry skin, heart problems, mood swings, and even depression. Fish row is rich in essential long-chain omega-3 fatty acids from eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and dicosahexaenoic acid, DHA, which have been linked to less inflammation in consumers, improved cognitive function, healthy mood and mental health, better vision, healthy blood pressure, supported cardiovascular health, and strong immune function, and more. Plus, Paleo Valley Wild Caught Fish Row is enhanced with other additional compounds and nutrients such as protein, DPA, choline, selenium, vitamins E, C, D, B2, and phospholipids for added benefits. To get your Paleo Valley fish row, go to paleovalley.com forward slash check 
15. That's P A L E O Valley.com forward slash C H E K 15. Living 4D listeners save 15% on purchase using the code C H E K 15 at checkout. Check 15. If you're interested in research to back anything I've shared here, feel free to reach out to Paleo Valley and they can help you. Enjoy feeling great eating Paleo Valley's wild caught fish row capsules each day. I love them and I use them every day. There's two unfortunate challenges to adopting and applying the natural science or the second scientific revolution as you're presenting it that I see come and come face to face with. And I'd like to hear your comments on this. And that is one, in order to be a practitioner that's skillful at this second scientific revolution approach, it takes a lot of study. You really have to do a fair bit of study. You can't just be an expert at functional medicine testing or popping joints or uh, stretching or extra. You have to have a quite a holistic, comprehensive understanding of the integration of systems and subsystems and parts. You have to understand psychology. You have to have a, a fairly comprehensive understanding of spirituality and its in its actual form, not some new age cooked up bullshit. Um, and so that takes commitment from the practitioner. And as we said, to, to do that properly, you have to go through it yourself. You can't just use a bunch of intellectualism or you'll never really understand it. The other problem is, 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 is really, it's a deep one too. And it's a challenging one. And, and that also has a lot to do with our capitalistic culture. And that is that too many people in the health profession think about the health business as a business. And there's this resistance, conscious or unconscious, to actually treating people to resolution because then the cash machine doesn't keep ringing. So what happens is, is you really have to change your mindset. See, my my goal as a therapist is to get people not to need me anymore. I don't want people to come back with me with every itch, scratch, bump, and headache where a lot of chiropractors and doctors and therapists, they, they just make their whole business off of that. They're, they are like mommy. Run to mommy when you bang your knee and get a Band-Aid and, and get a kissy and things will be better. So that, that just keeps the door ro- revolving all the time. And that kind of stuff drives me nuts because you quickly become a basically a, a, a babysitter. And uh, you know, a good example is people, because I use clinical massage therapy, a lot of people love being touched. And so when it comes to doing some of the other facets of therapy, they'll say, oh, I don't want to do that. Can you just massage my neck? Like, no, I'm not going to do that. You can go hire a massage therapist to do that because my job is to get you to the point where you don't need to keep going to doctors and therapists or you're or you're going to be stuck on this wheel of nowhere for the rest of your life. And then the whole medical system is a disease maintenance system. As you know, it's not not a healthcare system at all. So the, the there's really, it's going to take some real um, maturation of the human being and, and our motives and our missions and our values to get us into this second scientific revolution, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And as far as the, the first, uh, sorry, the second point is concerned, Yes, there are going to be in any endeavor in the world, there are going to be people who are just in it for the money. And of course, there's no benefit in resolving anybody is if they don't come back. Um, But the way I deal with that is the way that um, the quantum physicists, um, I think it was David Bohm or somebody, I can't remember one of the quantum physicists, uh, because they were meeting a lot of resistance from the classical physicists. and. He, he, they said, well, how are you going to make any progress? You know, everybody's criticizing you. They don't accept it. And the answer was one obituary at a time. <laughs> That's true. Oh, my God. So, 
you know, we, we just have to ignore those people because they're not going to change. That's the way they are. And so we focus on those who are interested, like you, in, you know, resolving it, making sure people don't come back. The, the objective is health, not management of death. And so the issue then of treatment, or sorry, of uh, training is, first of all, to train someone as I hate to use the word gatekeeper because it has a control notation, but an assessor, an initial assessor, and and also someone who can treat uh, fundamentally quite far. How long does it take for uh, a family physician to train in the current medical system? What seven, eight, nine years? Uh, I think it's four years in the Western in the United States system. Only four years? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, four, four years to get your general medical degree, okay. which would be kind of the standard baseline physician. Then they go into specialties from there. Okay. Well, I could say, based on my own experience and, and training people, that in four to five years, you could train someone to understand the basic laws of this scientific revolution to understand the basic essence and elements of Steiner's work and of Reich's work and of basically um, how the whole thing works. Now, that doesn't mean it's in-depth or you're an expert in everything. I mean, I still don't understand everything Steiner wrote. You know, or, Oh, or, my God. It'll take many lifetimes. Yeah. I, I'm still digging. But, you know, between him, Jung, between him, Jung, all I could list you a bunch of them. <laughs> but you understand enough to have a feel for what is encompassed this whole topic. Now, if you then spend another couple of years, three or four years, you could become a very good practitioner on the medicine side, okay? And a fairly good practitioner on the regimental side to the point where I would say you could take care of 60 to 70% of people's problems just by what you know. And then for the part you can't, oh, well, I never went four years to chiropractic college, so I just have to send you to a chiropractor. I didn't uh, you know, do weightlifting and training, and I don't understand uh, what you understand, Paul, so I'm going to send them to you and get you to you know, deal with them on that. But the advantage is that all of those specialties that, of course, we don't have time to study, but we've studied the broad system and the broad therapeutics of causality because we're not treating uh then you're getting into specialties ah you need a specific input that i don't have the training for but luckily there are people out there that's exactly what they know what to do it's like my daughter once had um, a climbing accident she almost lost her leg and she shattered her foot in so many pieces that and I was talking to her about the surgery, and she said they had special foot doctors who specialize only in certain parts of the feet. Yeah, there some bones in the feet. I thought, well, isn't that great? So your average surgeon, he said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not trained for that. I'm handing you off to the, you know, the metacarpal specialist or whatever. Yeah, metatarsal. Metatarsal. Sorry. And so the the point is that. All of those specialties that we now have in the natural health field, they won't disappear, but they will be brought to a height of capacity and effectiveness that they don't have when they're trying to te generally treat all sorts of things that don't fall within their jurisdiction, you could say. But now every practitioner, every patient that comes to see the chiropractor, wow, amazing. The person, everything's right there and it's not snapping back and it's not you know uh, the person that doesn't have other problems so everybody is going to have a role in the system but to train a general practitioner if we could use that term actually would take between four to six years and it's not that difficult now you would spend the rest of your life becoming trying to become a master at it of course oh yes yeah this is really what's really now emerging as integrative medicine. 
Yes, that's what integrated medicine is trying to do, but they don't have this understanding that I've been talking no, about. No, no, they're just saying... They don't have the dynamic physiology. No, no, they're still at the physical level. It's just, okay, yeah. you're good at the shoulder, I'm good at the knee, I'm good at the spine. Exactly. It's just a bunch of carpenters. There's all carpenters hanging out. But the idea is there. And, and oh, yeah, we- yeah. It'll grow. It'll grow because they're, they're either going to have to grow or go out of business because people are losing faith in the system because they're not getting any results. Well, they're going to go out of business, I think, in eight to 10 years, simply because they don't have any real cure. They don't have any real healing. They just have a management. and things are getting so complex and so difficult and people's health is getting so bad in general terms for many reasons that you and I both know um, that they will become so ineffective. All will be left will be the surgeons who've always been, who have nothing to do with the medicine side. They're just surgeons. They're technicians. And so that part is going to collapse because people are just going to see that they get nothing from it. In fact, it's worse. There's a an approach that we haven't discussed, but I want to put it on the table because I think it's a bridge, a rainbow bridge of sorts. And this is what I have done, and this is what I encourage all my Czech professionals to do. And that is that as we're developing our knowledge of what we would call what you've described as the general physician, because that's you know, my program's multidisciplinary. So I got medical doctors, chiropractors. I mean, I got everybody in there and I'm cross training them. Say, look, this is what you need this guy for. And this is what you need this guy for. That's part of the importance of having these different people in the classes is so they're cross pollinating all the time. Yes. But what I encourage my practitioners to do, and this is why there's such a strong spiritual component and how I apply it to the individual is there's a progressive development in the interrelationship of the person's sense of self, which you you could call it the ego, but really it's an integration with the soul. And so what, what happens is over time, when you develop enough conscious connection with the soul of yourself, then I say, now I'm going to teach you how to use your soul to connect to the soul of the patient. And I go directly to the soul. I have to have the frame of context. Because if you don't know anything about a liver, but the other person's soul says, well, I have a problem with liver enzymes, you can't interpret that. So you're blind. So what I do and what what has helped me help a lot of people is I gather all the data and I say, okay, it points to such and such, but I then have a conversation with their soul and say, this is what it looks to me is going on. Would you tell me what I need to be aware of so that I can help you? You have brought yourself to me. I have a soul contract with you. How how can I fulfill this contract with you? And so that person's soul says, oh, you need to look at what happened in their last lifetime. They they had a very bad battlefield injury. They died. They they died in in a a state of guilt because they knew they were doing something wrong, et cetera. So then I might go into a past life regression, which I've done many times, and it's knock problems right out. So there's that middle ground where the individual can grow themselves in their spiritual capacity and come to work with the spiritual realm. And that actually can be more powerful than referring people out. Because if you don't have that capacity, you might just be referring out to somebody that fits your own model and your own perceptions, but you don't know where you're blind to what's the deeper issue. And so that's really been the modus that I have followed because I've gotten so many patients that have hit a brick wall and run out of money. I mean, I've had people that have spent $500,000 and they're flat broke. And they're like, Paul, this is the last $10,000 to my name I spent to come see you. So I feel a very deep obligation to, to really do what I can do and have to do. And I can give you a quick example. I, I, I'll, I'll just make it short. A lady was seeing one of my top uh, practitioners who had worked with me for many years clinically, and she's a physiotherapist, an acupuncturist, highly trained physical therapist, world class. And this woman had chronic SI joint pain, 
and pelvic pain she couldn't get rid of. And, and this woman that was my, the therapist was one of my instructors. And she finally just threw the towel in and she came and got me one day while the lady was laying on the table. And she said, Paul, I, I am against a wall here. I've tried everything that I know. I've done all the assessments you've taught us. I can't figure out why this woman won't heal. No matter what I do, her pelvic girdle won't stabilize. And I didn't have a lot of time. I was between appointments. So I just went in. I didn't know the lady. I asked her to lay face down because I didn't really want her to see what I was doing. So just to kind of distract her mind, I sat at the end of the table, put my hands on her feet, one hand on each foot. And I connected my soul to her soul and said, you know, this is what's going on. How can I help you? What's really going on here? And I immediately began to get um, movie-like images of her living with this guy having lots of sex with him, but I could see that he was in love with her and believed that she was going to marry him. But I could also see her soul was telling me she has no intention of marrying this guy. She's actually just staying in for the sex while she's looking for a new partner. And her soul told me she feels very guilty about what she's doing because she knows she's manipulating the guy. So she was holding this karmic energy of guilt in her pelvic girdle, and it was disrupting her biophysical psych biopsychophysical integration in other words the guilt was blocking the flow of life force energy through her pelvis and so after i gathered this data i i said to the lady on the table i said well may i ask you some personal questions um that that might seem a bit intrusive but i have to ask you these questions because they're directly related to these types of pelvic girdle functions i said and I, you know, of course, I knew what I what I was leading to. And I said to her, I said, You're in a relationship, aren't you? She said, Yes. And I said, It's been going on for a number of years now, hasn't it? She said, Yes, nine, eight or nine years. And I said, I need you to be really honest with me. Does this man think you're gonna marry him? And she started crying. She said, Yes. And I said, But you really don't have any intention of marrying him, do you? And she said, No. And I said, are you looking for another partner and waiting for the right person to jump out of this relationship? And more tears. Yes. And she like trembling now. And I said, well, I want you to understand that you're holding all this energy in your pelvis around your sex organs because you're guilty about all the sexual pleasure you're getting from this guy. And you know that you're not being honest with him. And I said, if you want to heal this, it's time to go home and be honest in the relationship. And if he wants to stay in it with you to have sex and have a friendship, that's fine. But if you keep misleading him, you're going to keep generating all this karmic energy and it's going to disrupt your entire physiology. And it's going to go from this to something worse. You could get cancer of your ovaries or cancer of your cervix or any number of things. And so, you know, point is, is it hit the nail right on the head. It took me about seven or eight, maybe 10 minutes to do that. But this girl could have seen 50 more doctors and therapists before we ever got to the issue. And so she went home and, and dealt with it. Um, and I could give you 50 more cases like that. But I think that's what's missing in the model. But it, you see, the real point I'm making is if I hadn't have done the work spiritually throughout my, my lifetime to develop the ability to do that, then I too would have been part of this you know, endless circle. No, no I, I, I take what you're saying. It's an excellent example. And certainly if you can get to the core of what the blockage at the moment is, and there's a kind of release or catharsis, um, it can be very powerful. Um, I would say the following is that the challenge we're up against is that there are very few people who can do uh, intuitively what you do. Um, and yet. There is a science, you could say, to training people to be able to do that. There not is. The way, not the way you do it, but to be able to do that in a way that um, allows them to get at those blockages, you could say, um, through uh, a fairly rational uh, systematic process that can be taught fairly easily. You can actually train people to do that, even though they don't. I don't have that capacity. I don't have that intuitive capacity that you have. I couldn't have done what you did. 
Um, but I can uh, use different ways of getting at that um, that are fairly easy to learn. And you could teach anyone who has um, a sole purpose for that, you could yes. say. So we can actually, if you, the, the, in, the possibility is there to train a lot of people to do that for, um, in a fairly short space of time and very effectively. Now, um, their effectiveness might not be as great in terms of overall uh, it, it, uh, compared to if they had a kind of intuitive capacity to do it. But if they're 80 or 90 percent effective, that's a pretty high that's a pretty high rate. That's kind of what science allows us to do. But it's like the story of uh, John Henry and the steam drill, you know, that song. Um, you know, that brought a steam drill and there was this uh, guy who could pile drive uh, John Henry. Uh, it's an American song. I don't know if you know it. But anyway, um, he beats the steam drill, but he dies because his heart gives out, you know, like. But the thing is, the, the steam drill just keeps going, doesn't have a heart, doesn't stop. So science is a bit like that. You can train people to do fairly effectively up to a certain point, but a master at something, no, you're never going to achieve that specific level. But how many masters are there out there? Uh, not a lot. That's the problem. Well, yeah, it is. It is. And, and I've, I've always said, I didn't come here to train the masses. I came here to train, to train masters so they could affect the masses and, and I don't consider myself a master. I consider myself a practitioner. Hi, everybody. I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. Did you know that statistics show that only 8% of men and 3% of women do any regularly scheduled exercise, including walking a dog? If COVID taught us anything, it was that now it's more important to be healthy and fit than ever before. Are you ready to create the body you want, get fit, be healthy, love what you see in the mirror, wear the clothes you've always wanted to, and have the confidence that you can do it efficiently and effectively? How about having beautiful abs and a lovely butt too? If your answer to these questions is yes, then stick with me for the next couple of minutes and I'll tell you exactly how you can do it. I'll tell you exactly how I do it. I was shocked while doing research for course development when I came across a study showing that the average person today only knows 8 to 12 exercises. I was just as shocked when I found a completely independent study showing that the average person today only eats 10 to 12 foods, and that's it. They just live off 10 to 12 foods, often don't look or feel well, but don't know why. That's pretty sad when you consider that there are about 350,000 edible plants and a fantastic variety of flesh foods we can eat to ensure adequate nutrient variety to keep ourselves healthy. Many people know they need exercise but feel insecure about going to a gym because they aren't sure what to do there and a lot of people that could afford a gym membership can't afford a personal trainer and that sadly may be a good thing. Why? Because a significant percentage of personal trainers got their certificate by doing nothing but reading a book and passing a multiple choice test online. There's no specific technical training on many of the most important aspects of technique or the science of exercise. Rarely is there any mention of the importance of diet and lifestyle factors that are integral to any effective conditioning program. This would be like studying to be a medical doctor and only studying the bones and not knowing anything about how the rest of the systems of the body work or how they work together. My dream when I developed Integrated Movement Science Level 1 was to create a truly functional holistic training program that anyone, not just exercise and health professionals, could study, apply, and get fantastic results with. My Integrated Movement Science program not only gives you the essential training on key self-assessments and how to correct any imbalances identified, you learn how to do all the most important functional exercises we can do in a gym with correct form. You also learn the essentials of how to design an exercise program effectively so that you get the results you want, including how to progress each exercise and your exercise program in carefully planned stages so you get healthier, stronger, and fitter without getting injured. The Czech Institute put Integrated Movement Science 1 online so that you can study and practice at your own pace. Any teenager, athlete, or adult can understand what I share and apply it, and it won't be long at all before your friends and all the personal trainers at the gym notice that what you're doing really works and start asking you questions about how you're getting such good results. In fact, you may love the experience so much you decide it's time to change career and become a Czech professional because it feels so good to help others. 
To help you look and feel your best between now and July 1st, 2023, I'm offering Living 4D listeners a discount of $125 on my Integrated Movement Science course online. That's IMS1 online. To get your discount and start creating a new, healthier, fitter, sexier you, go to C-H-E-K dot group, G-R-O-U-P, forward slash L number four D I-M-S-1. That's check dot group forward slash L four D I-M-S-1. This is not case sensitive, so it will work with either upper or lower case. You will get your $125 discount by using the discount code L number four D I M S one. That's L number four D I M S and the number one. Again, it's not case sensitive. Remember, my special offer ends on July 1st, 2023. Now is your chance to be the change and enjoy showing everyone the new you. I'd love to see what you create. Enjoy your journey. A couple of comments here. One, biogeometry teaches the same system using biogeometry, but not what I do. But Angie can find these things using biogeometry. Angie's also a shaman. She can use different approaches than I do, very different approaches, still get to the same issue. Dowsers, very skilled dowsers can do the same thing and get to the same issues, but a different path. And my last comment on that regard is that what you're calling intuitive is not intuitive. Intuition is a process of having an intention and then emptying yourself and waiting for the answer. This is using the same principles I use when I remote view, except I'm actually remote viewing by going not to a location, but but to the consciousness of that person or the soul of that person and having a direct communication with the God that is in them through the God that is in me, meaning the source of consciousness itself. So it's actually a direct communication between the essence or the entelechy or the soul of that person, the organizing intelligence or the spirit and my spirit at a soul to soul level, which isn't actually intuition because intuition is passive. This is active. It's not intuition. You're right in the way most people use it. I use it in the way Goethe and Steiner use it, which is an active participation. I see. Uh, you're 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 making a connection, as you say, soul to soul, spirit to spirit, and that is a capacity that allows you to do exactly what you did. But yes, it's not. A, I'm not talking about the the normal idea of intuition, but more on the Steinerian, Gatian idea. Yeah, I'm only making it clear because listeners would automatically. Un- I'm you glad know. you did. I just yeah. tend to talk. <laughs> I tend to talk in the area I understand. But you're right; it can be misunderstood. Yeah. Now, I, I've taught lots of, of my higher level practitioners to do this, and they do it very successfully. But here's the challenge. In order to do this, you've got to heal and eliminate belief systems. Because any, for example, I have many people that come through my training that are hardcore Christians, and they will go at me left, right, and center with Bible passages and whatever. And I say, look, I am teaching a universally applied system of healing. And you will never be able to treat anybody but Christians with that mindset. And I'm not here to limit your therapeutic abilities to an ethnocentric orientation because we have world-centric issues to deal with. So if you cannot grow out of your limited mindset into a truly open-hearted, I'm here to help everyone and all life forms then you will not ever really be a Czech professional. You will always be some kind of variation of a Christian ideology that's limited and has a few extra tools, but that's not what I'm here to teach you. So one of the things I'm doing in these big developmental levels of classes, I'm trying to weed out the people that have to really do some personal healing and some personal growth, or they will never succeed in reaching the ability to do the kinds of things I'm talking about. And I don't think we can ever truly just rely on technology because technology is always dealing, as you've mentioned, with what's weighable, measurable, and objective. But the nature of some of these things are not in that realm of reality. The the, the actual etiology, what's driving the stuff, if you say, okay, 
you're, if you want to do therapy, you're going to deal with the causal realm, but the soul is a causal. It is not a bunch of dominoes, right? It's really much more comprehensive than that. It's, it's so comprehensive. It's hard to even put into the English language because we don't really have a mindset for this type of reality, unfortunately. And then, you know, most people orient religion and spirituality together, but they're, they're very, very different because religions are all based on belief systems, but true spirituality is, is based on um, an openness and a trust in higher consciousness and love itself. And, and that really, to me, is also someplace that we've got to get everybody to. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, people self-select themselves out in the sense of if they have a belief system that you know is not uh, compatible with this broader way of looking at things as you described uh, they can they block themselves they can't they can't move ahead I agree with you on the uh, the thing the soul itself is a causal as with the spirit uh, but the you could say the components that Steiner has identified that operate within the organism and that um, Hahnemann and, and Reich have identified, these are causal. Yes, they are. Yeah, there's a bridge. There's a bridge. And they affect uh, the operation of the soul and the experiences of the soul and what the soul can carry across the, the threshold. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so by addressing not so much the soul per se, because that doesn't need treatment, just as the true self doesn't need treatment, but the addressing all of these other components that make up your being on this earth in a given incarnation, by addressing those and removing and lifting all of the blockages uh, that are in the way. I see it like uh, somebody going down a road and... Um, there are these trees across the road, there's a rock slide, et cetera, et cetera. And if the person has to stop personally and spend a lifetime just removing one tree across the road, and that's all you, that's all you can do in a given lifetime, okay, that's a natural kind of evolution. But if you can have a technology, and I don't mean technology in the materialistic sense, but a, a system, a thought yeah of whatever, that can remove that tree fairly quickly so he can go on to the next blockage. And then you can help them remove that. And you can go much further down the road before you have to cross the threshold. You have a kind of um, science, as Steiner would call it, a spiritual science, allied with a, a true natural science that allows you to evolve in mind and consciousness a lot faster than if you just do it the old fashioned way. Yeah. The, the analogy that I would give to, to sort of harmonize with what you're saying, but, but to share it from a different perspective, if you say that the soul is the undivided light of God, it's unconditional love. So just imagine you got a, a slide projector and then you have the mental level of reality. And so then we'll say, okay, whatever belief system you have, we're going to put that slide in the carousel. And then whatever traumas you have because of believing that, we're going to stick those slides in there. And then whatever uh, emotional traumas you have and, and parental traumas and life trauma, we got to stick each of those in there. Then we got to take all your physical injuries that are distorting the flow of life force through your body. We got to stick them in there. So by the time the average person gets to us, that light, you look on the screen and you just see mud. That's exactly the problem. That's why you can't you can't go on symptomology because everything is just mud. Uh, yes. <laughs> but if you go on causality, you can ignore what the appearances are and you can immediately go to no, your problem, the reason you have a pelvic blockage is because you know you've got this conflict over over this relationship and guilt emotion or the reason is because you know you had this these problems in your life and they're now leading you to where you everything's falling apart and so you just ignore the everything falling apart except helping them acutely in the here and now but by focusing on the causality you are literally shifting things because the body is going to do the work for you if you take the blockage away 
your life force is going to go in and do what it does well. Well, you don't have to direct it. You don't have to tell it what to do. It knows what to do. It's just being blocked from doing it. So suddenly all sorts of things start resolving because you're removed and you're systematically removing these underlying causations. And those causations go back, you know, quite a far away. So that's why the causal approach, you can get a lot done, even though you may not know the specifics. But in certain cases, if someone has a really uh, weak kidney, let's say, you might need to bring someone in who's a kidney specialist, as it were, yeah. to suddenly pour a lot of support on the kidney because it's beyond your general capacity. But that's that's always going to be the case. You know, yeah, I know a lot about helping the kidney or the prostate or the liver or whatever. But in this case, this is so deep that I need to bring in someone who's got knowledge in that area. You know, they spent their life just on that. I, I used to know a, a pharmacist who spent his life studying uh, hormones. And what he didn't know about hormones wasn't worth knowing, basically. But the point is, he uh, would come into cases just to focus on the hormones. And, and he would, you know, solve all sorts of problems where everybody else, you know, throwing up their hands because he knew more than anybody else. But you know, that's his role is, okay, you got in and you do that. And that's the beauty of needing each other. I need you because you've got knowledge that I don't have. So getting to do a podcast with you helps me say, okay, good. I've got that part covered. And, oh, I need to look into this aspect or I need Rudy's reminding me to go check Steiner's teachings on this. I mean, that's, that's what we're all here to do is grow together. And exactly. I think when, when, when medicine starts getting territorial, then you've destroyed the whole thing. No, it, it, it can't be territorial. It needs to be scientific. And that's what Steiner was saying. It's not about your opinion or my opinion. It's about the science, about the laws, the principles, about truth. This is how it operates, whether you like it or not. And this is what the implications are, whether you like it or not. And it's a matter of saying, okay, how do we organize ourselves in the light of the fact that this is the science, this is the scientific foundation? And then you can have great conversations because the language we share is the same language. Otherwise, we're talking, it's like talking Russian, Chinese, English, Hungarian, and because we're all coming from a different perspective. But if we all have the same language, whether it was Latin back in the medieval times or Greek, you know, back in the Roman times, the point is that we can have a conversation because we share the same understanding about the fundamentals of the science, like all scientists around the world, true scientists. One thing I've been trying to get into the conversation all the way back to the beginning when we were talking about this whole over, over orientation toward the physical and not realizing the spiritual. You know, I've studied enough of crystallography and chemistry to know that, I mean, I've got several books talking about that chemists and crystallographers have come face to face with the fact there is some kind of a guiding intelligence and a crystal itself is not a dead thing. It grows. It's alive. Yes. So the more, you know, intelligent ones say, okay, we've got to look into what's organizing these crystals because it's certainly something not material. And, and so you'd think that with chemistry and crystallography coming right up against this face to face that they would start applying this awareness across the board in medicine which is full of chemistry but they don't they don't because of a belief system and yeah. the, belief, the belief system is what steiner calls materialism which is that the reality is the material now quantum physicists are the same they have approached the threshold where they can very quickly jump across and be in the world you and i uh, inhabit but they won't because they just keep looking for smaller and smaller particles. They can't get past the, the solution, the way particle problem is pointing them to, and so, which is it's all about mind. And they, they can't reach that. But same with these, these other people. They cannot, something's blocking them. They'll come up to the edge, but can't make that, they can't make that jump. Well, a lot of it, I think, has to do with their personal psychological development because yes, yes, one, yes. One, once you come face to face with a greater truth, you've got a choice, adopt it and risk being ostracized. It's kind of like someone who's a Christian, but finds Buddha 
or Buddhism and thinks, oh my God, this has got all many, all these beautiful aspects that if added to my Christianity would be beautiful. But the day you start talking like that around your family or your Christian friends, you can, you're going to get attacked. So if you're not ready to go on the hero's journey, stand on your own two feet or do, you know, go through the individuation process, then you're going to be a closet person who crosses the threshold, but doesn't ever tell anybody about it because you're not ready to be an adult yet. Yeah, you don't want to be ostracized. And and this is, again, what science is about. It's not about a particular view. So you can find uh, Buddhism in scripture and the gospel. It's the Sermon on the Mount. That is word for word Buddhist. So the key is not about Christianity Buddhism. It's about what is the science of the evolution of mind and consciousness, as Steiner would say. And that's why Steiner uh, focused so much on the Christ event, not because it's a religious event, but the fact that from an evolutionary scientific perspective, this was a massive, uh, important shift in, in Earth evolution, you could say, and therefore affects us very much. But the point is, you're absolutely right. It's, it's the, the, what it draws me is the whole science. And if the science is saying this, then any belief that says something contrary has to fall fall away. And I can tell you, I've had many beliefs fall away. <laughs> so, yeah, me, me too. And 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 that that really is the the Achilles heel of science today is because there's so much money being made off of belief systems. And the other thing is, if if you if you actually understood the Buddhist correlation to the Sermon on the Mount which you could easily also say is Sufi or Taoism, if you understand those, because it's perennial philosophy is what it is, then what happens is, is to the degree that that becomes common knowledge amongst any sect, you lose control of the people and your ability to get them to conform and pay money, and, and you now lost the government of religion. Uh, and because so, the, the, the name of the game of the people running the earth, whatever you want to call them, is control. Yes. The control system, and so everything makes sense based on on that understanding. But yes, it's not about uh, freedom. It's not about truth. It's not about. So we don't really have a science. We have a technology uh, based on a material science that is acceptable because it can be manipulated. But if you bring in a science that goes beyond the material. And you're getting into the soul, spiritual, the super sensible, uh, those elements. Then you are liberating life forces, which cannot be allowed to be liberated. That's the generative power. Because if your generative power is uh, running at full capacity, you don't need any government. Medicine. You don't need yeah. medicine. You don't need. You are an individual sovereign person, and you can operate in a relationship with your peers uh, on your own. And so then this cannot be allowed to happen as far as the control freaks are running the world. <laughs> I know. Questions I had. Um, you, you said here that you, you speak of the crisis of science in three parts. Have we discussed those three parts, or do you want to bring those up? Uh, well, I think that's uh, a lot of detail. Basically, it was what I said in the sense that um, the old Greek system of medicine, the Hippocratic system of medicine, which was based on the four humors and everything else, it basically got so, uh, you could say, mechanical and materialistic that effectively was not effective anymore. It was partly because the capacity to do what the ancient Greeks did was lost by the 1400s, 1500s. The second level was this uh, thing that Steiner talks about, which he called the second fall, which is the rise of the intellect, the loss of this thing that Goethe called the gemut, this emotional participative capacity of soul to soul or uh, as uh, Goethe would say, vasen to vasen, you know, this, this living being to living being. And that killed, you know, any attempt to really do what you're doing, for example, in, in people. It was all just measure, uh, take the chemistry, do the blood test, uh, do the urine test, you know, that kind of thing. And the 
The third element was simply uh, what I mentioned about Kant. Right. Philosopher Immanuel Kant coming along and saying, you know what? Medicine's not a science. <laughs> and that was a big shock, and it never yeah. will be. And, and this was what caused the second scientific revolution with Goethe and others saying, no, that's not true. Let's show you how it is a science. And they did. Yeah. And they created this second type of science, not a science of the material world, but a science of the living world. And it's not just a subjective opinion of, oh, I think this or I feel this or whatever. It's actually laid out in great detail how it operates and what the laws are that operate and how you can understand it. So there is a way of, you could say, understanding it very rationally, it can be taught very easily. Uh, to people who are open to it, not to everybody, but to people who are open to it. So those are the three elements that you could say came into it. And what happened then is that this got rejected by the weight of the material world, as Steiner points out. And so we ended up with, on the one side, this material science, and on the other side, a certain, how should we call it, uh, abstraction in in the vitalist side the vitalist camp oh there's a soul and there's a spirit and there's a life force but nobody knows or what to do about it nobody understands it it's just it's like a deus ex machina it just it's just there and that's what differ, differentiates us from the materialist but they can't do anything with it because there's no deeper understanding as steiner would say of how it all operates so this third path that uh, the scientific revolution came up with and Steiner and Reich and others are involved in was this very rational scientific explanation of exactly how this living power works, exactly what the laws are that uh, regulate it and exactly how you can therapeutically intervene in order to, based on that knowledge, in order to correct the imbalances, the disorders, and the diseases, as it were. So that's this third path that we're on, because right now, both the natural health side and the conventional medical side are really just empirical. We do this, this works. There's no broader understanding that I've ever come across as to this whole rational scientific understanding that emerged out of this, uh, you know, the second scientific revolution, because, again, it hasn't really been talked about much. So. One thing I want to talk a little bit about just before we run out of time, because I thought it was very interesting. I, I liked your diagram in, in your um, document you gave me on natural science, page 32. There was a chart called the syn uh, Synthetic Index. Synthetic. It, synthetic. Sthenic, okay, and it and it had the uh, person on the left looking sad and depressed, labeled indirect hyperasthenia, and in the middle was the hypoasthenia, and then there was a person on the right hyperasthenia. Could could you talk about those concepts and what you were trying to convey in that diagram? Because it seemed to me that was important. Yeah, you re you really picked up on that for sure. I mean, that is the heart of the matter of what I've been talking about, which is there is this optimal point of operation of a healthy person. Okay, everything's functioning, everything's firing on all four cylinders, and and you know you've got this proper oscillation between uh, you know uh, the different parts of the metabolism, the metabol uh, the catabolic, the anabolic, and you know in breathing in, breathing out, everything we know about the rhythms that Steiner talks about. So that's the optimal point. You're at the peak. You don't feel any part of your body. You're not conscious of any part of your body. You're just in a state of health. Okay, you can either get too much input from the outside world. So too much drink, too much food, too much sun, too much. Even too, too much, much information. Too much information, uh, too much criticism or negativity or, you know, whatever. Then you go to the hyper side. Okay, the hyper side means you start to get nervous. You, yeah, you're, you're buzzing. Activity, okay. If that hyper side continues and continues and continues, eventually it flips. Yeah. Yang becomes yin. Exactly. But that flip is the important point 
at which you go from a problem that is regiminal mm, to generation. Oh, well, we just stop talking to critical people. We'll stop drinking too much. We'll stop, you know, doing this too much. Oh, I'll go back to balance. But once you cross that threshold, you can't do that anymore because that threshold is now on the generative side and there's damage there and it requires a totally different therapeutic. Okay, now, if you're healthy, but now you're not getting enough sunshine, you're not getting enough vitamin C, you're not getting enough movement or exercise, you're not having enough love in your relationships or whatever, and suddenly, or not enough information, yeah. okay, then suddenly you're hypo, hyposthenia. Sthenia simply means strength. Oh. Your strength is reduced. Hyper means, oh, I'm running around, I could run five, 10 kilometers, but that's not healthy necessarily. Not okay, if you're, you keep you're, doing you're, it. You're, you're neurotic. You're neurotic because it's not a natural five or ten kilometer run. It's because you you're, you're hyper. And that's a lot of addictions that are nourishing that problem. Exactly. So now you're hypo because you're not getting enough. Oh, you're, you're a couch potato. You don't get. You eat too. Uh, you know. You don't get the right nutrition. You're not getting any. You know, good input. You're not getting enough love, etc. As I say. However, if that continues, eventually it's going to flip. And now it flips into the generative side on this side. Mm. And now you've got a generative problem and that problem becomes someone who's like environmentally sensitive. So they are so depleted, they act hyper. Mm. It's strange. On the other side, you have a point, a person who crosses the line and they're so hyper, they're exhausted. They're, uh, they're in a state of, um, what do you call it? Uh, well, pure exhaustion. They they they're they're overextended, and now they don't have much energy to do anything. They're kind of lethargic, but they're also wired. Yeah, I call same. those people tired and wired. There you go. So, but the important part of that chart was to show that you start from the middle and either work your way one way or the other, and up to a certain point, all the regiminal. Active uh, therapeutics work really well. Okay. But once you cross that threshold on either side, the regiminal things will help you, but they cannot remove the damage to the generative power. That requires what I call medicine. And that's where homeopathy and Dr. Hahnemann and his system come in because that is a specialized branch of the broader system of healthcare. So medicine is part of healthcare and healthcare, you can do a lot with it, but you can't change with healthcare regiminally, the aspect regimen as you can't change the, the problem on the indirect hypo or indirect hyper. Yeah. It's to, in an analogy, it would be um, if you have a problem with your car that is say worn out rings you can't fix that with better driving skills. No, exactly. That's a very good analogy. Uh, there are many like that, but that's the key. Once you understand that, it's not that, oh, well, regimen can't do anything. It can still do things, but there's always a limit. There, there's a, a recognition of jurisdiction. Ah, we've, we've strayed now into this other jurisdiction. And so we need to acknowledge that and we need to address that. Yeah, it's it's really... You know, a good analogy is in farming. If you if you overstimulate the soil with things like sugar and chemical fertilizers, you will overexcite the plants in the soil, and it'll make things grow and and be colorful. But you will actually exhaust the soil. So the first thing that you get is what I call burnout. So the soil becomes exhausted. But if you keep pushing it, you'll go to what I call brownout. So uh, burnout is an inflammatory syndrome and brownout is an, uh, is an osis. So instead of tendonitis, you got tendinosis. Yeah, a sclerotic. Yeah. So now you, you, you know, you've got a, a much deeper level of damage. It requires a very different approach. Exactly. Yeah. You, there, you've created a damage that now falls under a different jurisdiction and you have to apply different laws and therapeutics to it. So that's. That's just a very fundamental distinction. Unfortunately, today, almost everybody has ended up in the indirect 
camp, either on one side or the other. Yeah, it's very, very true. And it, it's, it's, um, there's so much I could say about it, but I'll tell you what, what concerns me about that, Rudy, is that children very early, I mean, we've got kids being born with serious cardiac problems and uh, Children's Health Defense recently put out a report looking at the, the blood of newborns, Hundred average newborn has 126 toxic chemicals in their body coming out of the womb. We, we actually are at a dangerous position because we have serious things we've got to do to bring the world back into balance, but everybody's in such a degenerate state. They can't even handle their own regimen. How are we going to deal with things like the World Economic Forum and, and the global crisis of environment? And the list is so high. I mean, it, it it's, I don't want to be a fatalist. I'm trying to be a realist, but we're in a very, very deep crisis where we're funneling down to a critical point where if we don't start focusing on real healing and and regimental balance and getting to some of the deeper belief systems that are disturbing and and driving all these regimental pathologies and belief system pathologies we're at a point now where we don't have the energy just like you said you got to start down at the physical level before you get heavy into the belief systems but we've got belief systems that are being brainwashed into people's heads that are going to take a level of commitment and effort and clarity on what we all want together that if we don't, like, we got a narrow window before we cross the threshold, like you just talked about, into a completely different level of possibly no return. I mean, I, I, I unless um, Jesus does come back and brings a lot of angels and starts cleaning up house and being daddy who's wiping bottoms for children that just didn't pay attention, which won't do well for the Catholic Church because they're the ones that's supposed to teach you how to do this in the first place. Uh, we, we've got, we could all be praying. Yeah, no, absolutely. There, there's definitely uh, grounds for being uh, pessimistic. But if you understand uh, in spiritual science that there's a, on the spiritual side, there's a whole uh, host of uh, spiritual allies, you could say, what Steiner calls the spiritual hierarchies, um, that are there to help us. We're we're at a critical juncture right now, um, as Steiner points out, but you can see it as well for many other reasons. We're at a critical juncture in the evolution of the earth where what previously was guided by higher powers, you know, um, has been withdrawn to such an extent that we are now more or less on our own, uh, for the most part as adults. Why? We're on our own because one of the reasons for Earth evolution is the issue of freedom and, um, and consciousness, freedom and love. And love is just all about relationships. It's who do you relate to? Now, in the past, you related to, well, because your parents said you should marry this person or the church said or the tribe said or, you know, whatever. And now you make your own choice. But of course, you know, we have to learn from our choices sometimes. Oh, that didn't work out so well. And, but the point is that we are at a point where we have to start making choices. Now, when people make choices, it doesn't mean everybody's going to make the choice that's going to lead them forward. There are choices that lead you back. But I think my optimism comes from the fact that those who you could say, have evolved enough and are incarnating and have incarnated are going to make those choices. And that's why you and I are there because they're going to come and look for somebody, not everybody, your average person off the street isn't interested. Um, but people are searching and what are they searching for? They're not sure themselves, but they end up in your office. So they end up in my office or someone else's, or they read a book or they something that triggers a, an enlightenment or awakening and they start on their path. But Steiner pointed out that we're as a result of this process of having to make a choice consciously, not just following what someone tells you, but having to make a choice that we're heading as a result of this movement towards materialism, transhumanism, and, you know, all of this uh, IA uh, intelligence, artificial AI, um, a chat bot, yeah. you know, et cetera, 
cetera, we're heading towards a divide. Now, you can already see it. Oh, hell yes. Politically, but not just now, but over the next centuries, we're heading towards a divide between those people who choose the light and those who choose to stay in the dark. And that leads to eventually uh, a big split, you know, in terms of Earth evolution. But to the extent that you understand the laws of nature and the law of, laws of nature's God, you could say, then you are going to be uh, protected. You're going to be saved because you're going to be healthy. So let's say let's say they release um, another. Uh, bug, if there ever was one, let's say you know, some Marburg or cholera or, you know, whatever. Something, yeah. Are you, are, are you worried? I'm not worried. I'm not worried because it's the same principles you use for any of them. Exactly. So the point is, yeah, I'll deal with it because I understand the law. I understand the therapeutics. I understand, you know, uh, my own body and how to protect myself, etc. So you are going to be, God made people to be proof against the elements. It's only when we stray from the path, you could say, that we become hypersthenic, which means weak in the hypersense or hyposthenic. But if we stay and get into that optimal range, you know, where we're sitting and it doesn't matter that cholera passes by. It doesn't matter that, uh, you know, they adulterate the, the food supply or this or that, because you will be strengthening yourself to handle that. You can digest anything if you're healthy, even poison. Okay. Steiner points out that the bodies are going to become more and more mechanical and material. Yeah. And we see that no, totally transhumanism. So the spirits that are going to incarnate, you know, Aramon. as we go forward. They are going to be the ones, the ones that survive are going to be the ones that are stronger, that they can actually live in a material, more material, rigid body. Because the body you have now is a lot more material and difficult to deal with than one from 300 years ago or 500 years ago. And so they will have this strength and ability to literally live in that kind of a, uh, a capsule in their next incarnation. And so they will survive because everything is a struggle simply because it's meant to raise us in mind and consciousness. So I'm not pessimistic in that overall sense. I don't like what's going on. No, I don't either. <laughs> I, I find it difficult and I know people are going to be challenged by it. But the good news, and that's what the gospel, you could say, evangelion in Greek is the good news is we were given this life science, the scientific system, this revolution of knowledge, which goes all the way back into scripture, if you want to, uh, that allows us to, you could say, protect ourselves, to grow ourselves, even in the face of everything that's going on around us. So. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I meditate on this, I talk to my soul about this, and um you know, the conversations are long and deep, but I feel that it's really all a process of evolution. It's the evolution of our capacity for love. It's our evolution of consciousness. It's our e evolution beyond dogma and closed belief systems into true spiritual realization and, and the ultimate of what Yogananda taught as self-realization. Yep. And, um, you know, I think that on the planet, there are human beings at, at a wide variety of different levels of of psychological and spiritual development. And there's the people that will be like you and I are uh, referring to and how we manage ourselves. And we're meant to be, I believe, as living examples of what's possible for other people. My philosophy has always been, if I get some kind of an illness, which I haven't had a day of lost work to an illness in over 40 years because I take care of myself and I know what to do when the symptoms appear. And I say, okay, this is exactly what you got to do right now. You don't go to the gym, you go lay down or you get in the sauna or whatever. You, you, you know, you use your mind intelligently. But I think that, um, you know, consciousness can't develop without, you know, you can't just have Luke Skywalker. You got to have Darth Vader. Everybody just sits around playing games with lightsabers. 
you know, if you if you have a deep trust in God, not a religious God that you know has a faction. I, I, I you know, my trust is in the creative intelligence that is behind all that is, because I've had too many experiences of it, and that's what's guiding me to help figure out why this woman's pelvis hurts. I mean, I think a, a genuine act of love is always supported by a hierarchy of of God, and exactly. and I think that's what we're learning to do and you know in, in a very short encapsulation because i became a father again at 56 which i wasn't excited about because i'm like oh my god I, this is the last thing i want to do right now i'm ready to retire and relax i'm tired and you know long story made short th th there was factors that were happening that shouldn't have been happening I was being very careful not to get her pregnant, but it happened. And in fact, it happened three times. The first time she got pregnant, she had a miscarriage because we didn't know she was pregnant. We were doing a lot of long, hot saunas and shamanic journeys and using tobacco, which is not a good idea. Yep. Then she got pregnant again and had another miscarriage, which we didn't know why that happened. But then she got pregnant again. And I'm like, okay, three times. Okay, there's a soul that wants to be our child. So I said, okay, I've got to, I got to go see who this soul is. So I asked my soul to guide me to the soul of the child and spoke to the soul. And I did then the same thing happened when Zoe came along three years later. I'm like, oh boy, this is another surprise. And both of their souls said to me almost identical things. They said, there are very significant changes coming to the earth. And we have very specific skills that are going to be needed. We chose you, Angie, and Penny to be our parents because, and they both said, we've been watching you from the afterlife for a long time, and you have the skills that will reactivate our knowledge. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Every every birth is a ch spiritual choice. You're born in a certain genealogical stream because that's what you need in order to, you know, fulfill your mission, as it were. As long as you're making choices, I, I see that I only ultimately have responsibility only for myself to make choices for myself. But in doing that, as long as they're resonant with, as scripture would put it, God's will, which is simply a, a matter of saying with your heart's desire, then you're helping everybody else around you that's connected to you. Because that choice, if it's the truth, the truth can only free and liberate and help other people. So ultimately, the key is not that you know what's good for anyone else. You only know what's good for you and make choices for yourself. But that I mean, I'm not talking about practical things like, well, we need to feed our child or this kind of thing, but broader life choices, they have to be uh, made based on what is ultimately in your heart's desire, why you came on this earth, because you have a mission to fulfill. And uh, as you, these two children, as you pointed out, they're, they're going to come and uh, because they, they need to come. And we came in the way we came because we needed to that's what we needed to fulfill our mission and everybody's mission is different and everybody's mission is important the question is as long as you make the choice to follow that path to follow that mission then you are going to advance you're going to uh grow you're going to be protected, you could say, spiritually. If you don't, then, of course, uh, it's like anybody, uh, you can stagnate. You can you know, stay where you are. I don't want to learn anymore. I just want to you know, stay with what I know. And as long as you keep learning like you're doing, you're constantly trying to understand, to know more. You, you're not standing still. No, you're, I, you're it's not in my forward. genes to stand still. You know, the problem is, is as you know, the more you learn and the more knowledge you have, the bigger your questions get. And yes. so I find myself on this, you know, I tell people God is like a horizon. The closer you get, the further it moves away. You can't ever actually get there. It's an infinite horizon. And so I just find myself asking bigger and, and more interesting questions. And paradoxically, <laughs> I wish it was not always this way. Some of these things have taken me years of meditation to get the answers to because 
the answer can't come all at once because there's things I have to learn to be able to contextualize the answer. So my soul's taking me on this journey. And then all of a sudden, five years down the road, I, I get a true understanding of what love is, but I, I wasn't ready to receive it before. Yeah, it, it it would have been given to you, but you wouldn't know what to do with it. It'd be like a tool, a given a tool, and you have no idea. You weren't taught how to use that tool, so it's of no value. Yeah, it'd be like someone 120 years ago finding an iPhone laying on a on a on, you know, next to where the horses are standing. They, they would they would be completely baffled and probably think it was a fishing lure or something. You know? Yeah, no, we we receive what we need at the time we're ready to receive it and able to do something with it. And uh, that's why it's not a matter of, oh, everybody should understand this. It's a matter of putting it out into the consciousness and the universe. And those who are ready to, that's the wonderful thing about the internet and your podcast, for example, those who are ready to hear it, not everybody who's listening or will listen to this podcast will necessarily, you know, uh, understand it. But uh, those who are ready will, you know, they'll jump up and say, oh. And, for, yeah, and even, even so those that aren't aren't ready and don't understand it, at least we've done the favor of planting the seed for them. Exactly. You will plant a seed and it may be several years later that it grows. It, comes, it grows. Yeah, exactly. So it's not about how many people know it or hear it. It's more that you put it out into the ether and you're doing your job because those who need to know will find, will find you. Rudy, um, another amazing conversation with you. Thank you very much. Are there any other closing comments you want to make um, on the topic today or just any closing statements that you feel are important? I think the, the issue that's important for me, as I say, is science, not belief, as you put very well, and that there is a science of life. It was founded. It does exist. It just needs to be better known. And I've written a number of books on it that I have on Amazon.com, which probably, and also that what I shared with you, that PDF uh, slideshow. Yeah, I loved it, yeah. You can attach it for other people or even just send it out in an email. It'll help people in terms of the, having listened to the podcast, kind of guide them more into the specifics. It was very nicely done. Lots of illustrations. I, I really appreciate you putting that together. Uh, I found it fascinating and it, and it helped me sort of look at what you were sharing versus how I already function and operate. So I'm, I was excited to talk to you because I'm like, okay, I got to see how this relates to how I perceive this because yeah. I don't really understand yet what he's saying here. But it's interesting because as you've explained things, I'm like, okay, I've got slides in my lectures that show exactly that. I just use different words. Exactly. Yeah. The terminology may be the same. The key is eventually we have to arrive at a common terminology or nomenclature because science, we have to, when we say intuition, for example, we have to know scientifically what we're talking about. So there, now for the people who aren't, you know, outside on the outside, we may have to explain it. But for you and I, when we say it, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about because that word has a specific meaning or 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 Vazen in in uh, Goethe, you know yeah. that has a specific meaning. So once we get the nomenclature, then we can have a very fruitful and productive conversation. But it takes a lot of work to get to that understanding, that common understanding. Yeah, so. well, it's the most important work we can do in this regard. Uh, where can people find you? I know you're still practicing. You still take patients, and um, I know that you've done a lot of work with vaccine injured people. And uh, so obviously you have the skills to deal with all sorts of, you know, traumas from the past, past lives, energy field related. Um, you know, my client and my friend, Jason Picard, who's my longest running client, has used you and he loved your approach. And uh, I also know some of other people I've referred to have started working with you. So that's fantastic. Um, where, where do you want to direct people to? Because you have an institute um, and you have personal uh you can work with people personally so how do you want to have people find you that way well there's two websites they can go to to get more information one is simply homeopathy.com uh very simple the other is more directed at explaining our treatment process which is um myhealthplan.center okay and uh they can always just send an email to reception at homeopathy.com. That's the clinic office if they're interested in treatment. 
if they want to know more about the what I've written and whatever, uh, they could go on to Amazon.com, look up my name. I have books on the spiritual side, but also a lot of books on what we've just been talking about. So that's available. Um, I have articles on academia.edu, if you know of that. And there's another one called uh, Research Something. I forget now. Anyway, but uh, if they just search under my name, they they will find a lot of information there. So. Well, thank you very much, Rudy. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I wouldn't doubt if we have more to talk about as we move forward. So Anytime you have something you feel is important to share that goes beyond what we've covered in these first two podcasts together, let me know. I really enjoy talking to you because I learn a lot. I love your perspectives. I get to see things from different angles. And I think you have a lot of common sense and you're for real, which is lovely. You know, it's not like you're trying to peddle some, you know, one prong gimmick approach or take this pill and everything will be fine or even, you know, a dogma. And I, I just, I really appreciate uh, the work you've done to grow and learn and, and support other people. And I, I feel like I'm traveling with a, with a brother in arms with you. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me on and, uh, you know, taking the time to listen and everything. I, I certainly enjoy our conversations because I find that we truly turn together in many ways. Yeah, we, we are turning together and it's beautiful because when you, when you, get to uh, learn from someone that you have a lot of appreciation for respect for um, because of the harmony. I think it's easier to learn. Like, you know, you, you, you we're, we're carrying each other along as opposed to, well, you've got to do it this way or else, you know, that, that kind of a stressful learning environment, but it's, it's like uh, it, it feels like, you know, you always open my eyes even bigger. I'm like, okay, wow. I can think of it that way. And, you know, it's, and it also helped me, see how I can use even different concepts to express my own concepts. For example, if I'm talking to a homeopath, I can borrow some of your concepts and I might be able to access them a little more easily because they'll understand that approach. So yeah. I'm very grateful. Um, thank you. Keep Please keep doing what you're doing. And thank you to the sponsors for all your love and support, your amazing products, your sustainable practices. Thank you to each of you for anything you buy from the sponsors that supports me um, so I can take the time off of client work and all the other things I have to do to pay the bills like the rest of you and focus on finding people like Rudy and spending the time to meet with them and do outlines and try to put together a real meaningful podcast so it's not just a bunch of yakety yak, gobbly gook, who's screwing who, Debbie does Dallas kind of craziness. Um, so. Lots of love to all you guys. I think uh, Rudy's probably inspired you today to really, really grow yourself into an open-hearted, open-minded state for all the reasons we've talked about. And I think today is the day to really spend time with yourself and figure out what is it you love to do that you can bring your heart and soul to the world and do that because that gives you the inspiration to do the healing work necessary and to develop the relationships necessary to have that great sense of joy and comfort of knowing that you really are here adding value and adding beauty and adding love to the world. And I think if we all do that, it'll be a lot more fun than if we wait until the shit hits the fan and then start have to picking up pieces and hoping we can survive it all together. So um, I hope you guys feel inspired to to become and to grow and to share and to love more. So I uh, look forward to sharing a lot more with you guys next time. Thank you all for joining us today. Lots of love. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Rudy Vespor. If you'd like to download a PDF created by Rudy to accompany this podcast, you can go to bit.ly forward slash Rudy Vespor. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash R-U-D-I-V-E-R-S-P-O-O-R. You can find out more about the School for Romantic Science and Healthcare at romantichealthcare.com. There you can find holistic education for self-exploration or become a romantic healthcare practitioner. 
Also visit the Hanuman Center for Heil Kunst and Homeopathy online at homeopathy.com, where you can learn more about the comprehensive study programs for healthcare professionals. For those interested in private one-on-one sessions for specific health needs, you can visit the HCH Romantic Healthcare Clinic at myhealthplan.center. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can also watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. A big thank you to our sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley, and Organifi. Their support is essential in producing this podcast, and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products they produce. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcasts. 